Welcome to the podcast. It's dedicated to making you a faster cyclist. The Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. I'm Coach Jonathan Lee with our head coach, Chad Timmerman. Hi, everybody. And back, our CEO, Nate Pearson. Hello. How you doing? Good. Good. Can you let us in on your vacation and... Yeah, I got fat. <laughs> and No, but really, uh, people should, uh, should understand there's two parts of it. One, yeah, getting fat and drinking alcohol and that stuff it hurts your fitness. But yeah. two, if you live at elevation and you go to sea level and you come back, the first day is okay, but you definitely get this little lull. And we talk mm -hmm. about it all the time, but you think like, well, I live at this elevation that mm -hmm. it won't affect me. But I've noticed, I feel like I'm, I'm doing like November numbers. Uh, yeah. This week back from vacation, hmm. uh, it's it's frustrating and it feels like it's never going to come back, Chad. Um, I'm will. scared of the next week. I'm at sea level for another week. I don't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> Chad just shaking his head. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Okay, yeah, cool. yeah, yeah, we will. Yeah, yeah actually, yeah, it's a good one. Uh, so I, I want to cover a few things. Uh, first of all, if you head over to our YouTube channel, we're going to have some cool content coming up this week with some race analysis stuff. Uh, we'll have the race where Nate and I work together. Uh, so then Nate could win the race. Exciting stuff. Um, yeah. That'll probably be put up next week. Uh, but then we also have some something from a short track race, a mountain bike race, and okay. footage from a pro. So that'll be coming up too. Oh, cool. It's pretty great. Any working titles for those? Uh, not right now not that yet. I want to share. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, pretty the, the short track one, it's so funny. So we're watching like a professional short track in this one, and you're just like I, – I watched it for like – about 10 times without data, right? I didn't see it yet. Hmm. I didn't have the data overlaid, but I just watched it that way and took notes on what we would talk about. And when I was watching it, I was just like, just move up. Come on. Like, yeah, <laughs> just go faster. Move up, you know? <laughs> and then we got data on the screen. And I was like, oh my gosh, every turn is 800 watts. Like, it's crazy to see how hard those races are with the, with the pros. Yeah, really and uh, 800 watts at like 140 some pounds. <laughs> yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, so uh, tune into that one. That'll be great, and we'll have an announcement coming with that too, um, and a special episode of the podcast that you'll hear, which is something that's actually a totally different format for anything that we've done before. Uh, but hopefully, you'll enjoy it, and it'll introduce uh, some of the content we'll be doing throughout the rest of the year with this. Uh, next bit, and I know we don't have this in our notes, gents, but uh, Sea Otter is next week. <laughs> and we should talk about that because we won't have a normal podcast next week. We will have some podcast episodes that we're recording, so we will have podcast content, just no normal live episode next week. So, uh, And then, Chad, you're gone the following week? Correct. So then we will have uh, uh, probably won't have a normal podcast that week, and we'll have something else in place because we're trying to record a ton of podcast content at Sea Otter. So... Uh, but you're racing at Sea Otter, Nate. You I and I are going. Yep. Which races are you doing? The road, circuit, and uh, crit, all in Cat 3. Did you see the weather for this week? I just checked it this morning. Uh, is it amazing? <laughs> no, not great. Uh, well, Thursday, it's raining, uh, like 50 or 60% chance of rain during the crit day. Which race is that? Oh, crit. Yeah, the crit day. That's an, And that's a hot dog crit. Um, which yeah. we're actually going to get into hot dog crits later on. Yeah, that actually sounds okay as a hot dog crit because you're only the really only hard turn is in a 180. Mm -hmm. You're going so slow, and if you fall, it's not a big deal. Yeah, there is a lot of braking, but like you said, the speed is slower, so it's not too bad yeah. of a deal. Um, <clears throat> and then I'm so I'm doing enduro on Thursday, and then on Friday the circuit race, which we'll be doing together. I think mm -hmm. you're not doing masters that day; you're just doing Olympics. yeah, I, yeah, just one. And then. We have Saturday off. We're going to go pre-ride the cross-country course, I think, that day. You mentioned something about that? Maybe, yeah. Okay. Well, I am. Okay. Uh, and you, please, it'd be great for you to join. And then on Sunday, uh, I have the cross-country race and you have the road race, right? Yep. Awesome. So if you're going to be at Sea Otter, let us know. We'll be doing a ton of racing. We'll be recording some great content, too. Uh, we'll be recording our races that we do. So then people can uh, tune in and check out that stuff. Uh, but it should be a good time. So that's the upcoming schedule for the podcast and what we're working on, just so that everybody knows. The next bit of news is about you that we have to get to. <laughs> so if people watch... It's not funny, dude. <laughs> it kind of is. It kind of is. kind of is. If people watch the road race from the Winchester circuit race, I think, uh, that was one where you lost by like maybe a wheel? A quarter wheel. A quarter wheel. It's like, yeah, it's like a quarter wheel. <laughs> and it was on an uphill finish. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, you thought... Gosh dang it, if I had an extra light bike like a tarmac, I would not have lost. Yeah, I've wanted a right? I wanted the tarmac for many years. And I'm <clears> thinking <throat> like on when you look at the articles, a medium between Avenge, because of Avenge and a tarmac, it's like a two and a half, three pound difference, right? Yeah. And I have I was gonna be like, oh, I'll put my I had extra light wheels. I put those in the tarmac. I'd have the heavier arrow ones on the Venge. I'd have 
what every racer's dream would be is a super light climbing bike as Liza could be a 61 and then a super aero bike for racing crits. And I'm going to be like, it's going to be a treat myself set. It's going to be awesome. Mm-hmm. Are you ready for some weights? Yeah, let's get in the weights. <laughs> okay. So this is with wheels. Remember we have some different wheels set up with here. the ultralight wheels <clears throat> in the tarmac. The tarmac weighed 16 pounds, 10 ounces. Remember that this is in a size 61. Yeah. So 16 pounds, 10 ounces, or 7.48 kilograms. And the Venge was heavier, but not by much. 17 pounds, 2 ounces at 7.71 kilograms. That's something. So there's something there. Something. It's, it's measurable. Yeah. It's like you've got basically like 0. 0.4 uh, kilograms, maybe not even, the, yeah, 0. 0.04 kilograms almost. Or 0. 0.4, yeah. yeah. So about a half a pound. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Without wheels... Here's where the clincher comes in. Without wheels, the tarmac was 10 pounds, 11 ounces, or 4.82 kilograms. Yeah. The Venge was 10 pounds, 11 ounces, or 4.82 kilograms. To the so gram. <laughs> so, yeah. So it's the exact same way. Oh, and this is why. Um, <laughs> this is so good. It, we, Jonathan saw me measure this, and just the disappointment on my face, because it didn't make crushed sense. Him. <laughs> uh, the, this is good for everyone to know. The, I have the SRAM Axis 12 speed on my Venge, yes. and that crank is significantly lighter than the ETAP 11 speed cork crank. They're both yes. corks. I think that's where the difference in weight. I think it's about. A, I think the tarmac frame. We didn't strip everything off, yeah. but I think it's about a half a half a pound lighter, which isn't much. Yeah, I would actually guess probably a little less. Okay. Yeah. Um, but anyways, with the crank difference, it's the same, and I'm not about to go by. Another yeah, yeah. 12 speed group set to save a half a pound. Yeah. And when we did this, the tarmac actually had the speed plate titaniums on it, and the Venge had the speed plate arrow or the arrow. Steel, ones. Yeah, the, steel ones with the arrow. The steel arrow, arrow ones. So that's, that's another. Yeah. I don't know how many grams, but enough it's that it, something. it's it frustrating. Might, it might very well cancel out the difference in the crank set. Like it's those, those pedals, it's a significant difference because mm. a stainless steel spindle, spindle is pretty heavy. So uh, yeah, and then I had the lighter um, S work shallow band bars with a S work stem. Much lighter stem because our stem on the Venge is pretty heavy, actually. Yeah, like we have an know? arrow kind of good for sprinting. Mm-hmm. So, anyways, if anyone wants to buy a sixty-one <laughs> <laughs> tarmac up for grabs, you're gonna get it. it's a good deal. It's only been written like twice. Yeah. Uh, so, anyways, the, a lot of people too have asked the differences between the two. Mm-hmm. We get that a lot. Like, how are the ride characters different? Yeah. yeah. Um, they're very very similar. Uh, what I've so similar that even with the weights the same, I don't I don't need to have both bikes. Hmm. But the difference is the tarmac has is it does feel a little stiffer. So when you're like climbing and putting a lot of power, it feels a little bit stiffer. But the venge feels very stiff also, mm-hmm. as you guys know. Yeah. And then descending, the tarmac feels more like razor like than the venge, but still the venge is amazing also. So it's it's I would say like a ten percent difference rather than. Going from the old Venge to the new Venge is like night and day. The the Vias to this one, yep. this one is amazing. Yeah. It was it's pretty close. So it's not a bad bike either way. Yeah. Um, but the yeah. So I'm just gonna keep the Venge. And... I, I want to point out a few things. Okay. So you're talking 61 to 61. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Specialized has something they call Rider First Engineering. This totally sounds like an ad, but a bunch of companies are doing it where they basically. So here's how it worked before. Like if you had a 52 and a 54, it might have the same head tube. But then in manufacturing, they just use slightly longer tubes in between them. But it's like the same tube. It's just slightly longer. And that was basically how they would make a 52 to 54. Then a 56 and a 58 might share the same head tube. And then a 61 might have a separate one, something like that. But they basically, they didn't design each frame as a unique bicycle. So then as a result, who's to say that your 54 actually behaved Mm -hmm. like your 58? Or another way to think of it is a taller rider is likely heavier. They have more distribution of mass over a bigger area, that sort of a thing. So you may actually want a 61 to handle differently uh, to, to provide a different riding feel than a, 50, than a person that rides a 54. Mm-hmm. So basically what they're saying with that whole rider first thing is that they've engineered that bike to behave exactly how it should for that person. And as a result, all the tubes are different. So when you see these weight differences that are reported with a 56 to a 56, something like that between two bikes, that does not mean that your 54 will have the same delta between the bikes, like in terms of the weight difference. So in the 61, especially because it's a bigger, longer frame and the Venge has big cross sections, 
they may have been able to use less material in some respects. Uh, the mm. tarmac kind of has thinner tubes, so maybe they had to use more. I don't know. Yeah. If I'm, but, someone from Specialized knows, please please let us know what the actual frame yeah. weights in a 61 are. Yeah. Uh, yeah because be this is just killing me. Yeah. And uh, it's hard to see any reason to buy anything other than the Venge and just ride the Venge. Honestly, yeah. Almost, almost everything. everything. Well, but I you, think that's why the majority of their employees that I see all ride the Venge now. So the which, other thing which maybe makes the same case for aero bikes across companies, across you know, the big bigger companies. Uh, well, Chris Yu, he mm -hmm. said that um, the one, and he's the engineer specialized, the one thing about the Tarmac has is uh, it's more compliant. And riding it, maybe a teeny bit, but really on the Venge, if you want a more compliant bike, it holds up to 32. Bigger tires. Yeah. 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 Honestly, that's Higher it. Tires. The, the, sorry, the Tarmac does 30s, the Venge does 32s. Um, you could yeah. just go bigger tires. That is way more than anything you're going to do with a bike. Yeah. yeah. And that, so, and it's interesting because you, I feel like it's actually a different experience, your experience on your new Venge versus my new Venge. Uh, like, I've ridden, I've ridden the Tarmac, but not very long at all, like a very short spin at a demo thing. And my Venge feels stiffer than a Tarmac did when I sprint, when I'm mm -hmm. putting out power, anything like that. So it's, it's, it different can vary too. from size to size. <laughs> yeah. So that's another thing to keep in mind, right? Um, so, and, and kind of that, that snappy feel that a lot of bikes have, usually that comes through some sort of engineered flex. Like a, a frame will, when you roll it into a turn, it will flex to a point and then rebound perhaps, you know, and it gives you more of a snappy feel. I don't know. Mm -hmm. An engineer would probably better uh, be able to inform us on that matter, but. Just the same, kind of a bummer. Well, actually, a big bummer. <laughs> when we were weighing the bikes, just, we're, Nate was like, everything I've been told is a lie. Or buy an aero bike. <laughs> just, just buy an aero frame and call it good. Yeah, I, yeah honestly, I think so. I don't know how. So I don't think that all aero company or all bike companies have their aero bikes perhaps up to snuff in terms of handling. Mm. I don't know. I, I don't, just haven't yeah, ridden them. I have no idea. But in this case, there's no way that personally that I would ever get a tarmac. The, I just I, get a bench. I'm guessing, too, in the future, because there's that weight limit on the UCI, the, the aero bikes will get so close to that oh, yeah. that everyone will just ride the aero bike. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, Unless they bump that weight limit, and if they do that, then we could see that's not going to happen. Stuff. And really, <laughs> if you want, ever changes you there. Changing <laughs> I'm sorry, this sounds like a specialized ad. They don't give us any money or anything. Yeah. But straight up, they don't. If um, you do want a more compliant bike, I would get a, just a Roubaix and then ride 32s. Sure. Like if you really are, you yeah. have back issues or something like that. But yeah, yeah. for racers, yeah. People who listen to this podcast mostly, mm -hmm. I would do the bench. Bench, bench, bench. Yeah. yeah, it's good for, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't pick anything otherwise. Uh, okay, uh, we are going to dive into something that we found recently, and this is going to relate mm -hmm. into other things too, a cool <laughs> conversation that, Chad, you've been researching something for a while. and Yeah, um, just a couple of new things have cropped up that are pretty interesting. I think yeah. it'll be interesting to our listeners. Yeah, we've talked about them a few times, so I'm excited to kind of share it. But uh, the first thing, and this interests me because I actually drink pomegranate juice pretty regularly. We're trying to beat everybody to the punch on this one because we know we're going to get questions. I mean, we'll yeah. have one submitted to the podcast or we'll have some discussion on the forum. So maybe we can preempt that and offer some information before this all starts to fly. So there's some research out there that pomegranate extract can improve performance. Supposedly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to dive into it? Yeah, so the study super new this year, 2019, Tor Gross, Tor Grosso, maybe, and Garcia, um, randomized, double-blinded, placebo-controlled, balanced crossover. So, you know, everything you want to see in a trial, so, so you can maybe lend, it, lend it a bit of credence. Um, and, and they're touting exercise performance improvement, post-exercise recovery, and force restoration, all due to ingesting, in this case, pomegranate extract. So mm -hmm. we're not talking seeds, we're not talking juice, we're talking uh, pill form extract. So they took 26 uh, amateur male cyclists riding at least two to four sessions a week, gave them a couple 375 milligram caplets per day over 15 days. Then they did a 14 hour washout. And then they, these groups, these are groups of two, by the way, 14 day washout, got out of their system and then flip flopped. So the guys who got the placebo now got the actual pomegranate extract. And vice versa. And and for what it's worth, the extract is, it's made by a company called Euromed, and it's called Pominox. Hmm. Um, I don't think we can get it in the States. So, huh. so bully I don't, Yeah, Europeans. have you ever seen pomegranate extract at stores? I never have. Oh, no. After I've, there's some on the way, gents. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> really? Oh, I read ahead from, and I ordered some from <laughs> not Euromed? this company. No, uh, but a I'm, different one. Okay. Well, if you're in, in Europe, you know, like I said, bully for you. You you've huh. got easy easier access to this than we do. Cool. And so their comp the uh, Palm or uh, Euromed's claims are improved circulation and endothelial function, much like we talked about with beet juice, where it opens the the blood vessels to the point where you know more blood flow, more oxygen delivery, modulation of vascular inflammation, so less inflammation of those very same uh, uh, blood passages, counteracts oxidative damage, pretty much like any 
antioxidants do, prebiotic effects, anti-fatigue effects, and interestingly, improvement of hair health. Hey, Jonathan. <laughs> I'm telling that's, you, that's I why it looks so beautiful. <laughs> thicker, thicker strands, denser. I mean, it's, there we go. So why not? Why not, why not throw that in there? It all makes sense now. <laughs> okay, and then um, it activates the whole nitric oxide synthase pathway. So again, mm -hmm. along the lines of beetroot juice. Though this study, I think they said they, they don't attribute these performance improvements to the, this particular mm -hmm. aspect of it, more to the the flavonoids or the polyphenols. So anyway, their claim, this study's claim, sorry, so, so no, more, no longer Euromed, now back to the study, mm -hmm. um, greater time to exhaustion and time to reach VT2. So all they're saying there is greater time to exhaustion, and I always struggle with that one because that's so yeah. subject to motivation. I mean, you tell someone, we need you to ride for 20 minutes, they'll make it happen. You tell them there's a, an extra $100 in it for every minute, they last past 20 minutes, and this has this yeah. has been used. Mm -hmm. They'll do it. They'll make it happen. Yeah. So I, I struggle with the whole time to exhaustion testing as a measure of performance improvement. Yeah. However, time to ventilatory threshold two, basically lactate threshold or functional threshold power, um, is a little more legit in my eyes. Mm -hmm. they, and on that point too, the, the, time, the TTE, time to exhaustion, since it is placebo controlled and mm -hmm. double blind, mm -hmm. that does, I think, it makes it a little bit better. It stands up a little better, yeah. for sure. Mm -hmm. For sure. I still think it's just a little too influenced by your, your psychological state. Yeah. Um, and then it might improve max power after prolonged submax riding. So you work at submaximal, you know, sub threshold riding for a long time, and you still have a good punch at the end of it due to this. Right. And it might Sprint restore. At the end of a race. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it might restore force in damaged muscles, kind of along the same lines. Hmm. Um, and but like I said, not necessarily due to the nitrate content so much as the polyphenol content. Hmm. So regardless, I mean, if there is a performance improvement to be had, you can bet <laughs> Nate's gonna exploit it, which is fair. So I get we'll, it. we will have a tart cherry pomegranate beat. <laughs> Cocktail, basically, that chocolate we'll take milk? in. No, they'll be all in my office. I feel office. like we're missing yeah. chocolate some dark milk chocolate, in there. too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we'll have it all, and it'll be great. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, one thing I think a lot of people don't understand, or maybe they've heard the term, but they, they don't know, what does double-blind study mean? Um, neither the people conducting the experiment nor the subjects of the experiment know which um, modification or... Uh, What's being served. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and that's for, being uh, you know, sometimes the, the study person, even though they don't want to tell something, you can just see on their face, mm. you know, yes. like yeah. they know <clears throat> that something's going to happen. And Look something that's hard to blind the subjects. I mean, you mm -hmm. can't, like, if you're giving them Coca-Cola versus uh, something that doesn't contain sugar and caffeine, it's hard to match them such that, I mean, anyone who drinks, and this is a bad example probably, but anyone who drinks Coca-Cola is going to get a taste of that placebo and go, mm, that's not Coke. I know I'm not in the Coke group. Yeah. 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 Whenever there's like a product being tested in, or a product. So if there's a study that supports a specific product, well, and when, it says, bias. when it doesn't say double blind, I pretty much disregard it uh, because yeah. you know, who knows what could go on there. And, and of course, I, but I mean, you need someone to fund these studies. So if it is, yep. you know, if a, if a hydration study is funded by Gatorade, you can't automatically discount totally. it because. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, and then the, the placebo is, you know, the, the famous sugar pills or mm -hmm. they'll give them some kind of other pill. And they usually say in the study what they gave them, mm -hmm. um, but they'll sometimes it's maybe. They described it. I didn't note it, but yeah, yeah. maybe it's a sugar pill, actually. And then maybe. so you don't even know if you're taking that mm -hmm. or someone else taking it. And sometimes, too, they'll uh, there's probably not carbohydrates in this, but they'll match the carbohydrates because they're testing something else. Yeah, they try yeah. to keep everything as controlled as possible. So that the only real um, intervention or the only difference between the two is exactly what they're trying to measure. So it's new. I'd like to see this, you know, repeated multiple times. But it's really cool, too, that they switched the group mm -hmm. after 14 yeah, days. Yeah, I like that. Mm -hmm. And the nice thing is, at least on Amazon, I don't have this brand, but um, in the States... It's pretty cheap. It was like yeah. a thousand milligram tablets for like ninety of them was twenty bucks or something. Oh, that is that yeah. is pretty cheap. Hmm. So that would be huh. ninety days for twenty bucks. Uh, sure, that's if the good. quality. If the quality, you know, the quality is yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's why there's some on the way. So <laughs> okay. like some, yeah. I don't think it'll hurt. And two uh, antioxidants inside of this, most likely. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that antioxidants are prevent cancer and are just good for your health. Just in general. reduce oxidative so, damage. Yeah, probably not doing damage. Unless, are we going to cover the antioxidants and training thing today? Uh, not, um, I don't not think directly. we're today. No, not no, specifically. No. We'll yeah. cover another time. Yeah. It, it, so this helps. We talked about beet juice last week, and we have no clue if these things counteract each other and everything else. But uh, this is actually something that I have used. I've used pomegranate juice to smooth out the taste of beet juice if I want. Um, it's a really good way to kind of smooth it out. Yeah, I actually um, saw mention of someone else doing that very thing. Yep, yeah. So little did I know I was ahead of the curve. When we go on trips, we buy tart cherry juice, and now we're going to also buy pomegranate juice. Yeah. Which is fine to me because they're both delicious. Aren't so, they? Yeah. yeah, they're awesome. <clears throat> Love them. Uh, so along these lines, and we're talking, I guess, research, and we're talking mm. things that happen in the body at this level, 
we've been talking about something, or you actually shared some information that you came across. Yeah, it's another new study. Yep. And Quite it was new. fascinating to me because it really answered like two questions that I've thought about. It's going to take us a while it, to get to those questions. It provides questions. some food for thought. It doesn't necessarily answer them, but, you know, they are testing a hypothesis. You know, and and it's, uh, it look, it's encouraging for sure. And, yeah. and some, of the, some of the findings are absolutely encouraging, pretty much undeniable. So it really digs into, it's talking about like muscle growth, I guess, in, in kind some Kind of muscle respects. memory, more specifically. Yeah. So um, let's dig into it. We'll get to the takeaways in a bit here, mm -hmm. but um, so let's just dig in. We've been trying to weave this topic into, because we've had questions that this would be an awesome topic to use as an answer. Yeah. but we just haven't gotten one of those and yep. we keep holding it off week after week and now it's like finally we're not getting the question that's working perfectly so we're just going to talk about it you can submit those trainerroad.com slash podcast we get a ton of questions every week it's awesome continue to do that they're particularly good this them? week do you want to ask the question <laughs> do, do you know what the question is i can ask the question i think we'll relate to this okay. i used to be a high level racer yeah. back when i was a teenager yeah. uh -huh. i've been on the couch for 10 years uh -huh. Can I ever get back to that high level? Heck yes, How long you can. does it take? <laughs> Go for it. Not very, Go not very, very, very relatively. <laughs> okay, so so the whole idea of use it or lose it, you've heard that for some time, right? You don't train, you lose your fitness. And, and to, to a large extent, that's true. So mm -hmm. detraining comes, w with detraining comes deconditioning. I mean, you can't stay fit by doing nothing. No, no shocking insights there. Um, what is interesting, though, is what they used to thought. They used to think that when muscles wasted, the whole muscle goes. And now we're finding that most of the muscle, or the muscle fiber in this case, does. But in fact, the nucleus does not. And this is this this has some serious uh, impacts. So first, let's just touch on muscle growth. Just a, just a quick one one sort of refresher, or you know, probably new information for a lot of people. Um, and, and, uh, and, and for the true muscle physiology experts out there, forgive me, I'm, not, I'm sure I'm not going to get this 100% right, but I have a pretty good grasp on this stuff. So um, if you think of a muscle cell, first off, they can be really long. I mean, if you think of just the sartorius. So it's a muscle that starts at your hip, rolls down your thigh, and then hooks onto your tibia. So it crosses the knee. I mean, it, this is a long muscle. That's mm -hmm. a, each, each, that muscle is composed of single fibers. So those are hugely long fibers. So the idea of a single nucleus, and nucleus being the control center of the cell, right, contains, um, it's basically responsible for protein synthesis in the case of muscles. It controls all the genetic information. I mean, it's basically the brain mm -hmm. of each muscle fiber. It, the idea of just one nucleus for a fiber that long, um, it just doesn't sound right. And it, in fact, it's not. When it comes to muscle fibers, they, they are multinucleated. They have many muscle nuclei. Hmm. Um, and then supposedly muscle cells can't divide. And this is, a, this is still somehow a contentious topic. And, and I can't, every time I start to dig into it, I just emerge more confused. So <laughs> may, maybe you can get more muscle fibers. Maybe the muscle fibers just get fatter. Maybe there's a combination of the two. It doesn't really matter. As long as I get stronger, that's all I really care about. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, within each muscle fiber, we have, you know, a bunch of nuclei now, nucleus, plural mm -hmm. nuclei, and on, and on the outside of the muscle, we have satellite cells. So these are basically stem cells that when the muscle is injured, when we do, you know, any form of training, whether it's oxidative damage uh, or for sure uh, muscle tearing and you know, micro mm -hmm. these, these cells split and they donate nuclei. So basically they're helping your muscle become larger and stronger and more capable. Hmm. So stem cells, basically, on the outside of the muscle, and this increases your work capacity, whether it's strength or endurance or you know any combination thereof. Muscle trauma. So, so what we're getting at here is muscle trauma and inflammation are what invoke this whole process. So this is a necessary part of training. We have to basically hurt ourselves in order to inspire adaptation. So damage, whether it be oxidative or actual damage to the muscles, micro tears, leads to inflammation. Inflammation leads to satellite cell activity. These satellite cells lead to improved performance gains, aka adaptations, or more simply just growth, hmm. muscle growth. And, and we'll talk a little more on this later, not much, um, gene expression folds in to all of this. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. So um, another term to throw at you is syncytia. So the muscles, uh, muscle tongue. fibers roll uh, in, in certain organs and, and, and uh, I should say cells and muscle fibers, certain organs, etc. The cells re reside so closely together, they're effectively fused and they behave as a single fiber. So we don't really call it like a, a single muscle so much as a syncytium or a syncytia. Okay. So it's just, it's just another term that uh, kind of folds into this whole thought process. So we take many uninuclear cells, and if, if they're stacked closely together and they work together, they effectively become a, a multinuclear cell. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, but yeah, in yeah. the case of muscle fibers, they actually are multinucleated. So 
But Got in it. any case, nuclei, hugely important to the growth of whatever, organ, muscles, muscle tissue, anything. Awesome. So the assumption was that when our, our muscle fibers atrophied, the nuclei died too. Said We found out that's not the case. The, the, the nuclei that they saw in, in the dead muscle fibers weren't actually nuclei that belonged to the muscle fibers, but belonged to other inflammatory, uh, other, other cells. Hmm. So now they died the muscle fibers and they saw, oh no, the, the muscle, the muscle nuclei aren't, these dead nuclei aren't the muscle nuclei. The muscle nuclei are still intact. So when you're talking about a person that like detrains basically because they haven't been training for a while, this yeah. is what you're talking about with atrophy. Exactly. Yeah. So the muscle, so most of the muscle is gone, but the nuclei are still there. So the little, the, the brain of the muscle fiber is still residual. Hmm. It's, it's hanging in there. It's part of the syncytium. So the fiber has gone, but this whole muscle syncytia, syncytia, <laughs> is, that, is that the word? It's, it's still there. So we still have all these many little brains, even though they're not really responsible for anything just now. And supposedly they have a half-life of about 15 years. Huh. That's a heck of a long time. Yeah. So you think you can only get, how, how detrained can you get over 15 years? And that's just half the loss. Then, you know, if you have any understanding of how half-lives work, then half of that takes another 15 years, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So they effectively are more or less permanent. Hmm. Pretty that's, cool. Yeah, it's super crazy. So, that, all, that explains why when like a pro cyclist who has been retired totally for a does. long time yeah. uh, shows up and he does a ride. Like we've had that a number of times. Yeah, here, you like say it all the time. Region. You're like, how is he, he, he was basically on the couch two months ago and now he's spanking us. How, is, how do you go from being so slow to so fast in such a narrow length of time? Yeah, they're like, they're overweight. They're, they've, you know, they don't look like the cyclists they once were. And in some cases still overweight and, and out racing us. Yeah. Well, okay. So uh, what impressive. you're saying here, you want to go through the, I think, you go through the takeaways. I, I yeah, have a question. So, yeah. Yeah. But let's hit the takeaways, okay. and then you can hit me with those questions. Um, so, so basically, all this is saying is that fitness reacquisition, or what we've termed muscle memory over the years, is easier if you had it at some point. So as long as you had it earlier in life, it's a lot easier to reestablish it. Mm -hmm. um, so you're never really restarting from scratch as long as it was there at one point. Um, and then more and, fast, more and faster muscle growth takes place upon retraining. So you can almost bank muscle. If you think of a teenager hit, hitting the gym real hard and then having a five-year hiatus from training and then getting back into it, that teenager has effectively banked muscle mass for later use once he or she resumes training. Hmm. Pretty cool. Um, it also has impacts for adults looking at, uh, you know, eventually, we'll, if we're fortunate enough, we'll become elderly folks. So even if you ha weren't an active teenager, be active as an adult. Even if you know, I mean, no one anticipates this, but even if you're going to have a hiatus from, from working out for a good long while, bank that muscle when you're maybe 30 so that when you're 80, there's something to, to call upon. Hmm. Um, and, and, and it's worth noting that as you age, your ability to generate new muscle nuclei declines. So get them while you can. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And then this also means, and this is kind of a bummer, but people who abuse metabolic steroids and testosterone amongst them have an unfair advantage potentially for life. Yes, I, <laughs> this is this gets me upset because people yeah. who get so people who have dope totally before, so. and they have uh, they have like a certain amount of time off, mm -hmm. and this happens too in um, all sports, mm -hmm. uh, especially with sports with in competition testing only. Like this is just in the same year, you, you, you know, you go sure. for like eight months of yeah. whatever, and then you go get te you're tested and you're totally clean, Yeah. but you have it for but the impacts. 15 years for the half-life. Yeah. So you've seen some of these people who are in, or who have raced in the doping era, right. and mm -hmm. some of them got caught, some didn't, and they're not guilty if they didn't get but caught. But they're still riding that way. <laughs> I know. Yeah. And they win and, and, and from like a bodybuilding <laughs> perspective or a strength perspective, the guys who abuse anabolic steroids, that's where if hyperplasia, the increase in actual number of fibers, if it's there, uh, there is an agreement somewhat of a consensus on the fact that steroids do lead to hyperplasia. You can get more muscle fibers if you use, utilize steroids. So whether or not that's fully accurate, I'm not, I'm not here to argue. Yeah, that's frustrating. It's totally frustrating. <laughs> okay, well, okay, so one more little point, and then we can talk about questions. But so, so this is all good and fine for, for muscle, which, yeah. which you know, it, whether it's slow twitch, mid twitch, fast twitch, it's all important, and we all want more of it or at least greater capability within the stuff that we're already packing around. But on the mitochondrial side, so the aerobic respiration side, us as endurance athletes, super concerned with how many mitochondria we're packing around in each of our muscle cells, more nuclei might influence these mitochondrial adaptations. Mm. So um, during detraining, you lose your mitochondria, but your nuclei are still there and they contain that genetic information for formation of new mitochondria. Mm. So the information is still there. The cell's still predisposed to produce more mitochondria than it would in someone who never really established that high mitochondrial content in the first mm. place. This is why you, so, 
what you're saying is if you had a high level of fitness before you ramp up really quickly both with endurance and strength and you uh i think the good takeaway is like the work you're putting in now whatever age you're gonna be able to bank on that for many many years that's yeah. that's what we're finding how and exciting is that the elderly thing is awesome too because yeah. that's um i've had my, my grandpa he fell like you know as you get older you get you have you have problems mm -hmm. and you can mm -hmm. fall sarcopenia and that can be, just yeah that yeah. could put you in a home or or uh, really hurt your life mm -hmm. and stuff yeah so. and on top of it i mean you, you as, as an elderly, elderly person you fall you break a hip or something due to yeah. lack of muscular control then you go to the hospital and any number of things yeah. can can oh yeah happen it's a, it's a in a hospital it's um, it's something to be avoided for sure if at all possible and here's one way to do it so there's there's the there's the very negative side of the fact that if a person artificially improves their performance with any sort of performance enhancing drugs sure they can have those benefits but lifetime ban you can yeah there we go <laughs> yeah, but you yeah. can also say yeah. That if a person has done this, you know, absolutely, you know, in a, I guess, a, a legal and fair manner, that they're still going to get those benefits. So, like, focusing in on that, mm -hmm. that is awesome for us, uh, average folks that are listening to this that are training now. Uh, it's something that should motivate you to continue to be fit for and, a good amount of time. And motivate you to tell your kids to be fit. Tell your tell your yeah. teenage sons and daughters to yes. hit the gym, to pick a sport, to to do something, to establish some of these habits too. But some of these, you know, yeah. mitochondria and 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 uh, cell myonuclei. That's the other takeaway. Like when you're young, you have an opportunity to really, really. The hormones are flowing. I mean, you're 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 in mm -hmm. a state where you can produce a whole relatively more nuclei than you can as you get older yep. certainly when then when you're elderly yeah so like when you are young that is the time to make sure that and and honestly just make sure that you're if you, i mean if you have kids and that sort of thing if you can help them to just do those fun active things uh it'd be awesome it makes it, it also makes a lot of sense because you see people that were I don't know a kid that really liked rock climbing or soccer or something when they were young and they they're, were a teenager. They're good athletes throughout life, and they end up being a good athlete yeah. and pretty versatile. So I know. did marching band. Is that <laughs> <laughs> there's some that bit of endurance incorporated there? Yeah. There's some endurance. Sure, yeah, okay. there's some endurance in that for sure. Not really, but okay. Thanks, guys. <laughs> more, nephew, more than riding the couch. My nephew does it. He's a he's a drummer in a band. They even went to like to the Rose Parade and like yeah. did that sort of stuff. And it actually is from what i've talked to him it's pretty hard actually yeah it's not like cycling right. no it's not well, we're, yeah. we were not elite athletes <laughs> <laughs> still just the still, same I, I would consider that more athletic than maybe bowling or golf <laughs> Thanks, yeah, at least sure. in terms of adaptation yeah no. yeah, yeah. It's certainly more athletic than sitting on the couch playing video games which is what yes. you know a bunch of them do so and uh, two uh people who <clears throat> maybe need to do a comeback um mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. older people no, as in Chad this, why, had this, this totally struck a chord I mean as soon as I saw that especially from the mitochondrial side because I saw the muscle adaptation I thought oh man that makes sense because I, I lifted a lot as a as a junior high high school high schooler and college student mm -hmm. and now it's really easy for me to, to to grow my strength in a relatively short period of time and then I read the mitochondrial findings like oh no this means I can actually get fit again on, on yeah. the bike I basically don't <laughs> no have the towel <laughs> now I'm thinking maybe I'll get back in the ring I think what this study shows too is that like we've all felt this that people who used to be fit yeah. can get fit again quickly um but it's good to see it like it's not pro science it's actual science mm -hmm. yes so the other part is that uh, <laughs> like uh going out into uh elderly age that mm -hmm. just it's that is such a cool the finding. impacts on, on not not just longevity I mean all these longevity studies don't sit well with me because they're talking about just people living longer maybe they could be on up teen medications their quality of life could be total garbage but yeah. they make it to 90 years of age i don't care i'd rather die at 70 and be healthy and thriving the whole time than than suffer the last 20 or 30 years of my life because i'm a health health yeah. health mess nate, nate so, wants to live till he's 150 at least yeah and i'm sure you want to do it in a in a high quality that's why we got pomegranate manner. pills coming <laughs> that's yeah. going to carry us there uh, let's get into Rick's question. This is relatable for you, Nate. He says, I started using Trainer Road this winter uh, partway into my base build, and I love it. He says, I just started listening to your podcast and have been binge listening, much to the chagrin of my wife. <laughs> we apologize, Rick's wife. Um, <laughs> he then says, anyway, on to my question. I primarily race marathon endurance races at a pretty high level, racing in the open and elite category in New England, and have had some good success in big races like the Austin Rattler, part of the Leadville series, finishing 10th and 7th overall the two times I went. So that's really good. Uh, really good when he's talking about marathon racing uh, in this he talks about marathon in two respects so austin um actually let's just carry through he says this year one of my key events uh, is the nue marathon at the beginning of july unfortunately we've got a family vacation now scheduled for 10 days leading up to the race and we fly home two days prior to the race 
And by the way, for those wondering, these are marathon mountain bike races is what we're talking about here. So he says, it will be a relatively active vacation with some hiking, et cetera, in Glacier and Yellowstone National Parks. I'll likely rent a mountain bike for a couple of short rides while I'm there, but I'm concerned that I'll drop too much fitness to race well, race well when I get back. So finally, my question is, do you think I should, do you think I should fly with my bike? And he mentions not my race bike, so I don't risk an issue during travel, which that is a good idea. That's smart, yeah. He says, so I can get at least a few short, intense rides in to keep the pointy end sharp, or can doing something like a few trail runs work in a pinch? And he mentions that I trail run almost daily. So <clears throat> he trail runs. That's one way that he can keep active, that sort of a thing. Uh, I guess where do we want to start with this one, Chad? Where would you jump in? First off, I just want to dispel the idea that you're going to lose a ton of fitness in 10 days, especially yeah. if you're remaining reasonably active. So even if you did nothing over the course of those 10 days, <clears throat> you might cost yourself some of your higher level fitness and you might cost yourself a little bit of your aerobic fitness. But in both cases, I almost think, especially if you've been hitting it pretty hard, that the recovery benefit will outweigh any decreases in your performance capabilities. I'd agree with that. I, I'm, I'm a little hesitant on the bring the bike and rent the bike sort of thing on just because it sounds like it's going to be an active vacation as is. Yeah, it adds a lot of stress to dealing with the bike, assembling a bike, maintaining it. it. I mean, there's there's a lot that goes with it. Yeah, if, yeah, if we, I was... We know this well. If I was in these shoes, I totally understand the fear. I would not just be like, yeah, whatever. Like it would, you know, it, it would frustrate mm -hmm. me too. And I also see like from the psychological perspective, 10 days of just fretting over the fact that, man, I should be training right now, man, I'm losing fitness. And, and these ideas get in your head and that can definitely take a toll too. But he's got just a 10 day gap and then he gets back two days prior to the race. That at least leaves time. Even if, again, on the extreme end of things, he did nothing over the course of those 10 days. He's got two days to sharpen up a bit. Yeah. And he could do sharpening workouts, a little short sharpening workouts, put back a little of his punch, get the painkillers flowing, et cetera. And it, that's that's something, too. In my mind, so my, my mind like is, is really like one side or the other with this sort of a thing. I either think I'm going to build fitness or I think I'm going to recover like like a pro. I would like, just try to do that. Focus on maintenance, and and that's an mm -hmm. easy thing to do, as we've talked about many times. You just touch on it. It's like a taper. The workouts are shorter, uh, the the overall stress load is lighter, but the intensity is still sky high. And during that vacation, I would instead of putting my energy and focus into trying to fit in a workout, personally, what I would do, and this isn't the right approach, this is just an approach. Personally, what I would do is I would put all of my focus and energy into recovering as well as possible in between those hikes with the family, in between all the other things with the family. Well, that's the other thing. This, is, a, gain some this is quite an active vacation. So mm -hmm. he could, <clears throat> if he brings a whole bunch of training fatigue into it, stays yeah. really active over the course of the vacation, tries to throw in some workouts on top of it, return from vacation, sluggish and tired, attributing that to a, you know, a decline in performance when in fact all it is is he's more tired than he was when he started the vacation. Yeah. So it's I, a very I, real possibility. My focus personally would just be to try to recover as much as possible during this vacation. Yeah, like, I'd, you know, focus just on that. focus on maintenance. Just make sure you have a couple short high intensity workouts in there and not necessarily high, high intensity, but something that matches race intensity. Meanwhile, Nate, you have taken the other approach recently with your vacation. Well, no, similar to what Chad said, but yeah, yeah, I, but I feel like I need train incredibly fast when I don't work out. Yeah. And part of that is because we live at elevation at 42, 4,400 feet here. Yeah. Part of it's just spending time at sea level. So when I come back and I haven't trained, um, I've kind of, I've lost some of that adaption to elevation. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what percentage of that is the, like the change in elevation and what part of it is detraining, mm -hmm. which is frustrating. But uh, if I were uh, Rick, what I would do is I would rent a bike and do taper workouts, like just like Chad said. Mm -hmm. You could do a whole taper workout with sprints and VO2 max efforts that are probably 30 to 45 minutes long. Um, it'd be really fun. Uh, mm -hmm. I think those workouts, especially yeah, if you nice doing- change pace. Yeah, really long stuff. And tapering into your final week before you do these events, that's like what we would prescribe. Mm -hmm. um, as long and I wouldn't do the runs. Um, the hikes, I think you're probably fine. Your fitness is way yeah, fine to do absolutely. hikes with the family. You're not going to gain any fitness over the course of those ten days in, in really any realm. Especially if he mentions that he trail runs pretty regularly, then that that hiking is going to be minimally damaging. I would it's, assume it's probably him. exactly what he needs. But well, then this is what happens though, Chad. Right with um, when you do short, really high intensity workouts, even those thirty second sprints, mm -hmm. um, and you have a a lot of volume coming into it, you can still repair your body yeah. but keep your aerobic system 
uh, pegged. It's the nature of a taper. Yeah. yeah. And, and even though they're anaerobic or sprint sort of <laughs> events, there's a whole aerobic cascade that takes place. So mm -hmm. the yep. benefits are pretty wide ranging. So you actually brought things to do those workouts yeah. this time on your and, trip. And so Rick too, I would, I would totally rent the bike because yeah. I, I agree bringing your, unless you're riding every day, bringing your own bike can be very hard. But since you have huge races two days afterwards, totally rent the bike. Okay. So I do a lot of travel. And I've tried so many things. I've brought my own like bike on trips. Mm -hmm. I bought a travel bike once and sold it before I used it or returned it. Um, I've used different gym bikes, different kind of workouts, and I think I found what the travel person should do. So if you have these sort of amenities available for you, or acquire them, I mean, yeah, you can maybe acquire. camping. Oh for yeah, example. if you're camping, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. camping. Yeah. That's what I'm getting. Yeah, at. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, first, I like the Garmin Vector pedals mm -hmm. because. So uh, this is going to be talking about using like gym bikes. Yes. Uh, Garmin Vector pedals because they have the the little like um, they have a they have a pedal wrench uh, little, location to take the pedal yeah. off rather than an Allen key. Yes. And it's, sometimes those crank arms have a solid back, so you can't get an Allen key in there. It's not that crank arms; it's the way that some of these spin bikes or gym bikes are made that you can't like. There's a plastic cover, and you can't get the Allen key oh, in. Yeah. Sure. And I've done that because if when you have the power tap pedals, they have only the Allen key one. And I think it's the older vectors. I'm not sure, but you can't get the Allen key wrench in and you can't take, put your pedals on and you're like, well, or you can take them off. You yeah. get them on, but you can take them off, yeah. um, which is very frustrating. So doing that, that way you get power. Um, you need a pedal wrench. And uh, as far as I've seen, every single gym bike has the, the 15 mil pedal wrench like uh, to take off the pedals. But on carry-ons, this I got stopped last time I did it. If it's over seven inches, um, hmm. you cannot bring on like a pedal wrench over seven inches. Interesting. Uh, there are supposedly someone on the forum said carry on or pedal wrenches that are less than seven inches. Of course they don't work as well. You might hurt your knuckles. Yeah. I hurt myself <laughs> when I did it. Uh, so you just have to have a shorter pedal wrench or check your luggage. Yeah. Okay. So, and when you put it on the gym bike, just do it. Don't ask. Um, <laughs> yeah. Sure. I, I yeah. was at a nice resort and I was just doing it and no one cared. And then one time someone goes, what are you doing? And I'm just like, oh, I'm putting on my pedals. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah just, you're really, you're fine. I like um, you know what you're doing. The other can, thing, can I give somebody yeah. a tip on that really quick when you're putting <clears throat> pedals on? Cause like, it's easy. If you're on a gym bike, you're panicked because somebody's like, might be looking over your shoulder, that sort of thing. You feel like you shouldn't be doing it, but remembering how to tighten and loosen pedals. You do it the right way. Yeah. Like the e just an easy way to do it is to think for your bike to move forward, you need pedals on it. So you move that wrench forward because there's reverse threaded on one side. Yeah. And then to, if you don't, if you want to roll backwards, you don't really need to pedal your bike. So you don't need pedals on there. So that's when you put it backwards. So it's, it seems silly, but it's a thing that can help. So then because the last thing you want to do is strip out an, an expensive gym bike and then possibly face some sort of a, a fee or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Suck. Yeah. So. I don't want to break it. Yeah. If you think you're going to break it, don't do any of this stuff. Yeah. Um, also make sure you have lube on your pedals because um, if it's a new bike, it's just, you're fine. But some of these old bikes, they are like rusted on. Rusty. Yeah, from all Sweaty the sweat. and caked up, yeah. Um, yes. And you can kind of look around and pick the bike that looks like it's it's well-maintained and, mm -hmm. and it'll be okay. Uh, okay, and then so you've got it on there. And this is actually going to work too. We'll talk about if you don't have power meter pedals. Mm -hmm. But once everything's on there, I've tried all different types of workouts like the aerobic ones, sweet spot, threshold, I think the best thing to do on vacation or travel, 30 minute to 45 minute, mm -hmm. super hard sprint workouts or VO2 max workouts. Mm -hmm. yeah. I say that because um, one for cooling, cooling you're gonna it's gonna it's a huge fight in a gym when you travel because the gyms are always warmer than you want and mm -hmm. you never have a fan. I've yet to be to a gym where the cooling was effective enough for a bike workout or even a treadmill run for that matter. I don't yeah. know how people do treadmill runs in gyms. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So the reason why you do these shorter ones is you will sweat but you don't produce as much heat and you have a lot of rest. So mm -hmm. I might do 30 second sprints and have four minutes in between. Yeah, they generate a lot of body heat, but they offer a lot of time and recovery to dissipate that body heat. Exactly. Whereas steady state workouts just rev it up and keep it up. Yeah, exactly. And also I feel like it takes less mental energy to do seven short intervals or five short intervals versus two by 20 minute <sighs> intervals. Yeah. Like, that is so hard, and especially with the heat. In a on, less than uh, motivating environment. Yeah, and a sure. weird bike and all that sort of yeah. stuff. And the nice thing about sprints, too, is there uh, there are power targets, but it's like it's pretty loose. Mm -hmm. So even if you're not, the cranks aren't the exact same length. So like, go as hard as you can. Exactly. Go as hard as you can. Um, 
and then having to be a shorter workout, it's great. So you kind of, what you do is you kind of get a little taper workout during this week. Mm -hmm. um, so you come back from your vacation, mm -hmm. you haven't lost as much, but you still get to hit it hard. Maybe, and like I said, I've lost, some, lost anything, but I think it's the elevation change. Um, mm -hmm. The last thing to say on this, or, or two things. One is if you don't have pedals, you could just put your feet in the clips and just go on RPE because Chad, yeah. like you said, sprints mm -hmm. go as hard as you can. Go as hard as you can. Yeah. So yeah. you don't even need to bring pedals. That's the easiest RPE to manage. Yeah. <laughs> it is. And if we're talking 20 or 30 second efforts, anyone can do it. Yeah. You just, just go hard. Can't really get it wrong. <laughs> exactly. So you can, in our software, you can look for sprints. You can just have the workout guide you through. You can have a heart rate monitor if you want. It doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. But on the rest, just go easy. Yeah. And on the hard, go as hard as go you as can. Hard. Yeah. Um, these bikes, too, are usually built much sturdier than your carbon bike. Yeah, so, so you can get after it. You can get after it, right? Like, especially <laughs> yeah. if it's a real like spin type bike yeah. that they use. Oh, they're hardy. Yeah, and a lot Usually. of times too, um, these gyms this, they'll have like their regular bikes, and then they'll have like a spin bike class. Yeah. So what I just and it's in this like wood floor room with mirrors. I usually just walk in there, move one over, get on it, and start working out. Yeah. Like, the the gym people like don't hurt their equipment. Yeah. But they don't really care. Mm. Like they yeah. just don't want you to get them in trouble. Huh. It, and it's also a great way if you don't like working out next to people in a gym, no one's going to really want to get by you when you're doing hard sprints. So they're going to yeah. look at you a little weird. Yep. So you'll have the gym to yourself. Uh, um, work out well. The last thing is watch out for gym bike watts. Mm. Um, oh, they, yeah. They're not accurate. Yeah. If you're going to go by power, that's not a reliable resource. Bring a power meter or go by RPE. Don't go by yeah. gym bike watts. And what I've noticed on, on this one with the, the Vector 3s, which are BC Rainmaker, like they're accurate power meters. Yeah. Uh, at like 200 watts or maybe 20 to 40 watts off. But then when I was doing like uh, eight or 600 watts VO2 max stuff, it was saying I was doing like 850. Yeah. And I was not doing 850 for a minute. No. Like, uh, so it's, don't, don't, I don't even look at it. I'd rather do ORP. Sure. I think an exception if you had watt bike, uh, spin bikes. Yeah, sure. watt bikes. That sure. Yeah, that's pretty Or legit. the stages Unique. bike that they have, those two are known as being really good. Um, but otherwise, uh, like a, a standard spin bike that you see at a, at a gym, I wouldn't trust. Yeah. So, uh, hopefully that gives you some advice in your prep for those marathon races, Rick, uh, plenty of stuff that he can choose from and at least what all of us would personally do. So Jordan says, I recently completed a short gravel grinder race. It was a two lap race with the first half being mostly uphill and the second half a long fast descent followed by a flat run into the finish. And this is on each lap says it was very windy and I was one of the stronger riders on the day. I ended up taking a lot of long turns on the front and shared the work with two other riders. I'd estimate that three of us sat in the wind for 90% of the race. The bunch was reduced to three of us on the second climb or second lap climb. And he says two who worked and one who sat on. I attacked on the steepest section of the climb and pushed it over the top, held my gap on the descent and TT'd flat across the finish line first. But this got him thinking. He says, my questions are, if I'm in a similar situation with stronger riders, is there a better tactic to employ on this type of course besides the obvious staying out of the wind more? Any tips for getting a group to work together? I tried pulling off wide a couple of times and even stopped pedaling at one point, but the, those following simply sat up as well. That's always a good sign that you're stronger than them. <laughs> you know, like if you do that for an extended period of time and nobody pulls through. So uh, addressing really the first question, if I'm in a similar situation with stronger riders, is there a better tactic to employ on this type of course? Meaning that it's got a steady, consistent climb, it's got a descent, then a flat run in and a windy day. I think this is a situation actually where Nate, you have been in a few of the races that you can see on our YouTube channel, you've been the strongest rider in the group, in the breakaway. So similar to this, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it is a totally different scenario. Once you get in with people that are as strong stronger or stronger than you. than you, it really does change. I've, I've been in a race too with stronger riders than me. Uh, the, <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, we all yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I mean, it's yeah. So I have thoughts, but you guys start. Yeah. I, I think, uh, maybe covering first getting people to work. And I, I mean, Chad, you have the most race experience here out of all of us, yeah. uh, different things you've done over the years when you're in a breakaway with somebody, yeah, I get them really to just hope for the best. And then I try to recognize who I'm in a break with. And a lot of the time you don't have the luxury of that information, especially mm -hmm. if it's, if you're racing anywhere other than your typical neck of the woods. Um, so you just kind of have to <clears throat> ideally recognize over the course of being in that breakaway, whether or not these people are as strong as you. If your if your turns are are hurting them, if their turns are hurting you, there, there's just information you have to glean on the fly before you can start to in, encourage people. Because trying to encourage someone who simply can't take more than a 10 second pull and then struggles to get back on and hang on, it doesn't matter how motivational you are, they can't do it. I find in that situation though, I'm like cool, like I'm 
Like I'm not scared of that person. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like they're doing some work that's good. But what about if they are stronger than you and they're not pulling? That's, I think that's what the question is, yeah, right? Yeah, that's what we're really getting to with yeah. stronger riders. Yeah, so in one case, you, you can just be prepared to sacrifice the break. Just say, okay, if you're not going to work, I'm not going to work either. And if that means we get brought back, so be it. So you, you're going to have to be a little stronger with your motivational tactics. I, I almost never resort to yelling. It's yeah. highly ineffective. Totally. And, and really, it just, it just sours the, the relationship between the riders. These are people you want to work with until you don't. So, so they're useful while they, while they are. And, and it's like any relationship. Nurture it in some ways. Mm-hmm. Don't don't be a flowers. Don't, don't be a jerk. Chocolate. <laughs> Do you like chocolate. some of my water? Yeah. 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 No, but honestly, it's, it's a fig bar. <laughs> it's a great point, and I feel like you have to. Uh, so, I, in this scenario, when you have riders that are faster and they're not working, like you said, you have to be willing to give it all up mm-hmm. if you really want to expose their true intentions yeah. with that break. Either way, it's not going to go the way you want it to. I mean, if they don't work and you do all the work, mm-hmm. then they're just going to use you up and spit you out and and go on to something better. Sure. But as soon as I hear a rider yelling in a breakaway, I just go, he's suffering. All we have to do is pick it up a little bit and it, he's going to be It can be out. a tell, yeah. And, and it's it's not 100% for sure. Mm-hmm. But because some guys just like to yell at everybody no matter what in bike races. But in most cases, you can bet that the squeaky wheel is the one that needs grease. In other words, if he's really loud then chant and, and yelling and upset. Perhaps, for sure. And just the opposite. If it doesn't say a word, you know, maybe mm-hmm. he's coming apart. I think that yet, so the way I look at it is I try to analyze every person. And if a person, for example, is just sitting in the back and not taking pulls, uh, that could be because the person's tired. That could be because the person's saving themselves. Mm-hmm. And you have to figure out which is which. And the way to figure that out is try to adjust the rotation. So pull yeah, exactly. out, maybe you take a drink from your bottle of water or something like that. Maybe you or tighten you the shoe, Or you start taking very shoe. short pulls and slot in directly behind that rider. Don't allow yep. that rider to. And, and some of the time, these riders who sit off the back will leave a gap expecting you to slot into that. Yep. Just keep on sailing right on by and get onto their wheel. Make them close that gap. Yes. If, in fact, you recognize this is a strong, capable rider, not someone who's struggling. Yeah, so like, uh, I guess getting back to that, the reason I'm saying you might want to disrupt the the rhythm of that group or move your position is try to get next to that person, whether it's in front room, back, and then you can get some signs. You can see if every time it starts to tip up and it gets a little bit steeper, if they get tailed off, uh, or if you get in front of that person, don't screw things up entirely for the group, but maybe you surge slightly when you pull ahead and see what happens with that person. Then see what they pull through when you do a slightly harder pull. See if it really, they struggle to pull through. But I feel like you have to be, instead of just, I'm here and I'm pedaling along, it really does, it's it's a good idea for a rider in a breakaway to try to bring in anything that will basically test the riders without disrupting the flow too much. Yeah. If you can do that, you'll figure people out and you'll say, okay, this is his motive and this is his current condition and I can use that against this person. So I, my thoughts are, if you're in a breakaway and there's one person who's truly stronger, mm-hmm. you're screwed. You have to either decide, like Chad said, I wanna give the breakaway mm-hmm. or race for second or something. And they're not working. Yeah. Even if they are working, you're probably screwed, right? Like if they're truly stronger than you. If they're that much stronger. Probably. The, the, but it doesn't here's, no, wait, 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 not necessarily though. The, yeah. So the next part is if they are relatively the same as you, but they're not working. This is when you can start to play games. And yeah. this still ha- this happens all the time. And this is probably most likely what happens inside of your category is someone's close to your fitness level, but they're not working. Um, the first thing that I would do, is, and uh, I've done this to people, is when you, you gap them off the back. So when, if they get behind you, if they're behind you, and you can get it so that they're behind you in the rotation, when, when they go to the back, and let's say your fifth wheel and their sixth wheel, you just start letting that gap open and letting it open. And because they've been riding on the back the whole time, right? Mm-hmm. And you just keep letting it open. And what they have to do is they're going to either have to come around you and cover it, and you're going to be able to get a draft, mm-hmm. or you're both going to get gapped off, and then you're both out of the break, or you're going to have to attack. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's kind of like this game of chicken. Mm-hmm. But if they're close to your fitness level, it's going to hurt them more to close that gap. Mm-hmm. And you're going to see, hey, this person wasn't tired. They can close that whole gap. Yeah. And if multiple people in the break do that to that person, you know, you can tell everyone, hey, this guy's not pulling, let's gap him. Yes. Then that person's going to either work or yeah. lose. It sends the message, we're on to you. We know, yep. we know what you're doing. You need to start contributing or we're going to start playing some, some crappy tactics and making you hurt. And you just have to be careful in that scenario that when you're doing that sort of thing, you don't put yourself in a situation where you're vulnerable to like an actual counterattack that comes from that rider or anything mm-hmm. else. Because... 
there and and I guess that getting back to the point of countering what you were saying there a bit, there have been I can think of many races where I was stronger than the people I finished around or that finished ahead of me, but I played the cards wrong. So it's you don't have to be the strongest person to win a bike race. It, they, you know that's kind of the cool part about bike racing. You can be close to as strong, but if you just play the race better, you can be better off. But if you say you're a half a watt kilo better than somebody in the break uh, and you're not working and yeah. everyone else is working, mm -hmm. it's it's just the odds are in the per the other person's absolutely. favor. Yeah. 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 Absolutely, yeah, yeah. absolutely, yeah. And, so, and as this is all taking place too, you start to, I mean, if you see someone who's distinctly the strongest rider that person's forever on your radar i mean from oh, that yes. point forward certainly in that race and maybe subsequent races but that's that's the person you're most concerned with yep. so that's the person that if you're going to attack this group you do it after they've just taken the longest strongest pull you can force them into mm -hmm. but that's the person that you're going to key in on you know hit them when they're weakest yep the, your, your your best chance of success is going to come when they're at their their lowest point relative that's the the, the next thing is if uh, this would be great if you could just say, hey, let's gap. This guy isn't pulling. Everyone knows. Let's gap this guy. Mm -hmm. The next time someone gaps um, and you're at the front, then you attack. Mm -hmm. And then it's going to be you're kind of like screwing the person that's gapping. Yeah. But if this person really is strong, they'll pull back the other rider and they'll have to do this huge effort to get back on. Mm -hmm. And hopefully then that sends the message, hey, you need to pull. This is going to happen. And if you guys can do that or you riders, because it's going to yeah. be either way, do that multiple times, you're going to hurt the person. Just burn them up a bit. Yeah. But Honestly, too, though, if they are super strong, I can think of one guy um, I'm racing against right now, Brennan, who just won Chico. Mm -hmm. He's just head and shoulders by everyone. We can't do anything. Mm -hmm. He's he's won every road race he's been in. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, That's like, why you maybe don't get in a break with him. I mean, you know who he is now. Well, hey, you I know mean, what, the chances of, of a podium, place? No, the yeah. chances of a podium finish are there. So yeah. that's cool. And if that's what you're okay with, but if you're looking for a win, then that's maybe not the break you want to be it's, part it's of. Very much so. So right now, my goal, get to Cat 2, points in a breakaway is much better than probably chances of a 50-person mm -hmm. field sprint, and the safety is sure. a lot better. And no one's unbeatable. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. he, Brennan's going to have bad days. Brennan's going to be tired at, at points where you're fresh. And, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. certain moves, miracles happen. And in Northern California racing, a flat tire could happen at any <laughs> time. Anything can happen. Yes. This just happened at uh, Bariani. Is yeah. somebody, uh, there was someone way off the front, and we were all like, oh, that person's going to win. He got a flat. Yeah. Right? And the whole another race now yep. started. Yep. Uh, and you just... Yeah. yeah, I want to throw in a, a few theoretical scenarios that we can jump on, but it, it, hopefully this causes you to have some focus when you're in a group. When you're in a group with riders, <clears throat> with riders, and there's different profiles, so we'll just generalize here. But let's say that rider is a strong climber. Um, one thing that I think to do is it, you're probably not going to beat that person on a climb if it's a r relatively stronger climber than you. Then in that scenario, you try to get them to a point where they're fatigued coming into the climb, or you try to put them in a spot of bother outside of their wheelhouse, uh, hopefully before, right? <laughs> before that sort of thing comes up. And the same thing goes if you know that somebody's a really good sprinter, that sort of a thing. You just have to find yourself, in fact, if you're coming down to a sprint finish and you know somebody's a better sprinter than you in the small group that you're with, I think it's always good to try to mark that person as much as possible and then preempt whatever they're going to try. Because you mm. know... Hopefully you know where they sprint from and you know that they are not going to want to launch that sprint early because they're going to want to exploit their weakness to the maximum potential. Attack them or get their wheel. Yep. And it's if you know it's a, yeah, a bigger rider that is really good in flats and in crosswinds, has a high FTP, that sort of a thing, in that scenario, you really want to try to put them in a spot of bother once you get into climbs. So it's a lot of bother. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's been so bike races. Yeah, that's what happens, man. It's classic European season. Bike races. Um, but when you do that sort of a thing, I, I think that you just have to look at that and think, okay, how can I, you need to figure out the strengths and weaknesses of each rider. And then hopefully if you have a savvy group, it's amazing how that stuff takes care of itself. Cause everybody recognizes that and everyone takes, takes the same lead and they understand what needs to Usually, happen. Yeah. Uh, and a savvy rider will try to also outsmart that group. But it, when you don't have that group that's aligned with you or is being as analytical or trying to take advantage of that, it can be tricky. Um, but group leadership definitely can be there. Um, you just don't want to be the yelly, pushy guy. Um, one more thing on the breakaway. If uh -huh. you're in the breakaway with someone who's stronger, someone who's not pulling, and you have a teammate, uh, the best thing is the person's on the back. You get a teammate just mm -hmm. barely attack off the front. You don't need to like kill yourself because you're gonna wanna do this lots of times, but you start opening the gap on the front mm -hmm. and the rider just rides away and then you don't pull, you know, you don't pull off. You're just slowly going whatever your easy pace is. Um, someone else is gonna have to cover that each time. And mm -hmm. the group makes that the hard person cover it, but even it's gonna 
it's going to put damage on everybody because they're probably not going to match that acceleration right away. Uh, so the, the bigger the gap, the more they're going to have to accelerate. And you do that. That's a good tactic anyways in any yeah, breakaway. When you, when you have multiple teammates in a, ta in a, in a breakaway, there's a whole new slew of tactics enters into the picture. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Day long. Yeah. We can cover that at another point. Yeah, we should. It's it's fun stuff. Uh, Raul says, and, and actually, I guess before I go into Raul's question, <clears throat> but that's really a lot of why we're doing these race analysis videos or these where you can actually look and see yeah. the onboard footage because we find ourselves in these situations and then we walk through and post and see what we did well or what we did not do well. Uh, so it's a good way to learn. It's a demonstration. And I'm actually, I'm on some of these races, especially at a, uh, Cal Aggie, we mm. or uh, Land Park, we talk about what we're going to do one way, mm. but I'm I'm trying to win different ways, or or at least not win, but race it different right, ways. Well, race yeah, well. yeah, race well different ways mm -hmm. because one, everyone thinks I'm going to do what I did last time. Yeah. Um, but two, it's good for everyone to learn to, totally. to like because I'll either do it right or I'll mess it up. More likely, mess it yeah. up, and then you learn something because Pete goes, "Why'd you do that?" This should be the nature of the lower categories. I mean, that's all yep. it should be about is learning. Yeah, and figuring yeah. out how to be the best racer you can. So that by the time you ascend to maybe P one two, you're capable and, yeah. and capable in in many ways. Yeah. Yep. And remember that none of us are well, not none of us, but none of us at least here in this room are paid to be successful bike racers for our results, right? I got sixty five dollars. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and you gave that sixty five yeah. to me. Thank you. But uh, we're not paid for our results, right? So you might as well have fun with it and yeah. test things out. Raul says, uh, hello, the other day, one of the guys from our group ride said <clears throat> something about eating sea salt before rides, not for the cramps and not for the day of the ride, but increasing his salt consumption the week before the ride. The idea is to increase his water content. You guys have talked in depth about carb loading and increasing your glycogen stores, but is there such a thing as increasing your, and he says in quotes, water stores? If so, what would be the best approach for it? That is how much salt and how many days in advance? And is there any advantage of, uh, or risk in doing so? And he says, by the way, I started using Trainer Row because of the podcast. <coughs> Rated five stars in the App Store. Thanks for all that you do. Thank you. Thank I appreciate you. that rating. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that's awesome. So uh, salt loading. Yeah, okay. So salt loading, there, there is a way to water load. I mean, heat, heat acclimatization, acclimation increases mm -hmm. plasma volume. So there is a way to, to, to water load. Sodium loading, isn't it? Um, really, you can affect your sodium stores in a much quicker manner. It doesn't need to be addressed. I mean, even carb loading can take place over a series of days. Mm -hmm. Sodium loading, you can basically do the morning of. Yeah. Um, I don't even know why you would do it the night before, but we'll, we'll get into that. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, first off, let's talk about sodium losses. On average, um, in just I'll cover the range. 950 milligrams of sodium per liter of sweat per hour. I mean, this is this is the average. So obviously, it's going to be a hot day. Obviously, you're going to be doing a certain level of work. You're not out there noodling. Yeah. It's not 50 degrees. Right. Um, the range is anywhere from 250. Some people are light sodium, lose lose low amounts of sodium. Some people as high as 1,800 milligrams per hour. Some even a little higher than that. So it's a huge range. And that isn't necessarily like you <clears throat> sweat forever like that, right? It's something that can change. Well, see, that's that's what's particularly interesting is you can do a sweat test, and, and, and a number of companies offer sweat tests. And mm -hmm. I always thought, well, we know that, that diet can influence sodium content, that acclimatization, acclimation to heat can influence it, level of hydration, dehydration can influence it, all these things. But, <clears throat> excuse me again, <laughs> according to, uh, I think it's Andy Blow at uh, Precision Hydration, mm -hmm. he, he mentions that Post infancy, so you know, basically, when you're large enough of a human to be able to ride a bike, it has basically stabilized. Interesting. Yeah. Huh. So such that if you do a, a sweat test, you really only need one per lifetime. Wow. Yeah, and I'd That's like more information on that. So if anyone knows, please, please, please feel free to chime in, and especially if someone from a hydration company like Osmo or Noon or Scratch or Precision Hydration are listening, lo would love more information on that. Yeah, because that seems crazy to me. But I mean, I guess... To me too, because yeah. especially, I mean, like one of the one of the aspects of heat acclimatization or acclimation is that over time, you, you lose less electrolytes in your sweat. So you're right. still sweating profusely. You're still losing so many liters or milliliters mm -hmm. of sweat per hour, but the sodium content that goes with it trims. Yes. Maybe it doesn't doesn't fall off that much. I don't know. That's, that's, that's where I'm, that's where I'm hanging up. So I guess, uh, he, he was mentioning like sea salt using that, but we know that sodium isn't directly just, you know, sea salt, salt, yeah. table salt, and they're both sodium chloride. And right. the problem with sodium chloride is we don't lose chloride in the, in amounts that are replenished by taking in sodium chloride. Mm -hmm. So you end up with a chloride accumulation mm -hmm. in the gut and this causes gut permeability, which leads to, um, basically water seeping from the gut, 
otherwise known as or part, part, part related to for sure diarrhea. Yeah. So GI distress. Yep. So that's that's the downside of just taking salt tablets. If it's sodium chloride, the chloride end of things is is too much for what your system needs. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And then conversely, or uh, yeah, conversely, the the sodium content you can overdo sodium. I mm -hmm. mean, at the point where you're ingesting too much sodium, where does it go? It goes to your gut. You know, it goes to your stomach, then goes into your small intestine. And this means you got to keep in mind that water goes to sodium. Water follows sodium. It's trying to trying to balance out the whole sodium potassium pump thing. Certain amount of ions in, certain amount of ions out, etc. That that. If you have too much sodium in your gut, water goes there instead of where you want it to go, to the skin for cooling, to the blood for, you know, bringing nutrients and mm -hmm. energy to the, the working muscles. And you get something called reverse water flux. Again, leads to a certain level of uh, basically a sloshing gut. I'm sure we've all hmm. been there. Oh, At yeah. one point in time, oh, yeah. you've had all that that, that buildup in your gut, hugely uncomfortable. Yep. And like I just said, it affects your ability to thermoregulate, and hydration isn't really taking place. The water's just sitting in your system. It's not hydrating what you want it to hydrate. Yeah, so salt licks are not a good idea. <laughs> salt licks aren't, and too much sodium isn't too. Yeah. So what do you do? You have to figure out what your, what your sodium level is what your sodium loading level is, you know, what you need. Mm -hmm. I had no idea mine's as quite as high as it did. I mean, I knew it was a salty sweater. Mm -hmm. Everyone's seen evidence of it. We have photos. I mean, I, I sweat a lot of salt mm -hmm. and it's not even relative to my diet. I, my, my salt intake's pretty consistent. Um, and it's, I don't think it's ever excessive, but I lose a lot of sodium when I sweat. It's like one of those. So like I started loading yeah. a lot of sodium and I'll, I'll, I'll get to, to that in just a second too. Mm -hmm. But, uh, Nate, do you preload sodium the night before? I think I heard you talk about doing that. Yeah, I did for Leadville. Yeah. And it was great because I had cramping too a, a while ago for those longer races. Yeah. So for a longer race, I will preload sodium okay. if it's going to be hot. So that's, I, I, I couldn't find anything on that, but that's not to say you don't do it. I mean, all of this is hugely subjective. This is stuff you have to experiment with in circumstances, ideally, that are as close to race simulation as possible mm -hmm. so that you know, you know, if I'm going to race in this degree of temperature um, for this many hours, how much sodium and you know, fluid am I going to lose and then adjust accordingly. So uh, all I do and all most a lot of athletes do is a pre-workout kind of an over, <clears throat> excuse me, an overdose. Mm -hmm. So a high dose. So if you know I lose, maybe you've done a sweat test and you know you lose 500 milliliters per hour or milligram, sorry. Then you know maybe you'll do 750 pre-race or a thousand milligrams pre-race. Mm -hmm. um, I know I lose a ton of sweat, so I start every long endeavor, or I have since I started paying close attention to this, with a 1500 milligram dose of precision hydration. In this case, mm -hmm. that's a heck of a lot of sodium. Mm -hmm. And then over the course of the ride, I, I take on either 500 or 1000 milligram packets per hour, depending on you know, how, how hard I'm working, how much I'm sweating. I haven't gotten to the point where I de I've dealt with anything, any GI distress, so I don't think I'm overdoing the sodium, and I have avoided cramps for, for quite some time and maintained a reasonably steady level of performance over the course of even some pretty long events, and I'll give a couple examples of that in a minute. So, and, and that's that I mentioned pre-workout, during the workout, and then post-workout, same thing. You're probably, you probably dehydrated your dehydrated yourself to a particular level, ran your sodium stores down over the you know, last hour of the race, whatever. Mm -hmm. So then load afterwards. And in my case, I hit another 1500, which is again, it's a lot of salt, but that's what I found has worked for me. Huh. Works for me. Some people, like I said, it's a big range, 250 per hour up to in the ballpark of 2000 milligrams per hour, huge range. Yeah. So you have to figure out what works. How do you do that? Pre-testing intake and testing your hydration level. As I've coined the term urine strips and toilet trips. I just typed that out, <laughs> rhymed. I like it. I'm keeping it. It's good. Um, so TM chat. <laughs> the, the, the urine reagent strips we've talked about before, more simply P strips. Mm -hmm. um, I've linked to them. We'll put those in the show notes. Mm -hmm. That's a great way to test hydration mm -hmm. because um, P color tests are basically worthless. They yeah. tell you nothing. You can influence those in a number of ways, none of them necessarily tied to your level of hydration. Mm -hmm. So don't just look at the color of your urine and think you're good to go. Get some P strips. They cost next to nothing. They're super easy to interpret, super easy to use. And then as far as overdoing the sodium intake, well, do you have diarrhea? Do you have GI distress? Mm -hmm. Well, probably cut back on the sodium, see if you can tone that down, mm -hmm. ditch it entirely. And in my case, personally, we've talked about, if, you've, if you're a fan of the podcast and have listened for any more than a year, you've heard me talk about some pretty brutal bouts with cramps. Some of them just, one of them in particular blew my mind. I didn't know you could cramp for 18 straight hours. It was 
It's to the point where I want to cut my legs off. It's so bad. Levi's Grand Fondo will ever live in my in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was one of them. That wasn't even the worst one. Yeah. <laughs> that that uh, 100 miler we did, the last 15 miles of it. Lost and found. Is it lost and found? Either way. Yeah, you were in a bad way. Bad way. Bad way. Couldn't I, was, even, I couldn't do anything. I was sending Chad. Couldn't drive my car home. I was sending Chad texts like, uh, did you make it home yet? Did you make no, it home? No, I actually had to stop because I couldn't actuate the the gas pedal without flooring it or being i mean it was downright dangerous so since then however i've paid attention to my sodium intake i haven't done a sweat test but i've paid attention to my sodium intake and of course you know the hydration that, that ties to it and you know we went to kona and we did basically five days big rides big tss accumulation and they were long in two hot, and three in hours hot and humid weather lots of sweating lots of climbing steady stress on the muscles didn't cramp one time but i was on top of my sodium from the very start yep. we go to powder creek to do days on days of hiking and skiing yep. first day i forgot to do any sodium I didn't address my sodium and i was cramping by the end of the day and freaking out thinking oh i have six more days of this then i realized i haven't been ingesting any sodium packets started on with the sodium Harder days, more days, didn't cramp one time for the rest of the trip. Yep. So I'm starting to recognize the correlation between sodium intake, hydration, and muscle cramps. And the the thing is, I'm sure that there's somebody out there that basically just like drinks like a, or takes in like a whole shaker of salt before they ride or everything <laughs> else and they still have cramps. Yeah. Cramps are something that is pretty nebulous in terms of their exact cause. There, or I should say, there are plenty of sources that it could come from. Yeah. from the, it's true, but I'm, but I'm this leaning, is what's I'm leaning in one particular direction. This yeah, is what's helping. There's Chad. many reasons, and I know we do short clips of this on YouTube. And someone right now is typing, "What about pickle juice? What about uh, <laughs> hot, hot sauce? shots? What about, uh, yeah, 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 some yeah, kind of like, find something that works for you." We've <laughs> talked about that and the and the, the different flavors in your mouth that might prevent cramps mm -hmm. and TRP like, channels. I mean, yeah. there's, or, yeah. we've talked about all these things. So uh, <laughs> hold on, though, you have to mention, Chad took. Uh, we're not going to say the exact name of the product, but a he, product that he took a product that promises was, something they couldn't deliver for me. That was supposed <laughs> to do that, and uh, the, the, the taste was slightly offensive. Actually, I think it tastes was like whiskey. Offensive. So yeah. You probably liked it. <laughs> yeah. I, I did actually. It's so, good. So he took all that in, then had a gut full of fire, and was still cramping. <laughs> he took like three of them. <laughs> it was hilarious. I literally took three of them because everyone always tells him to take these things, yeah. and now when people always tell him to take the product, and he's, well, you had one, Jonathan had one. You guys are just he was like cramping right at the base of like out. well, like we. Uh, there's an aid station at the base of the super of, of a tough climb toward the end of the ride. And of course they have this station. I'm like, it's perfect for Chad. And then yeah. sure enough, the cramps continue, but you just had fire in your belly. Yeah, The, the, the point is I have a, <laughs> so I have a, a real history with muscle cramping, but since I've started to pay attention to this in particular, yep. I, I have no sign of it, no hint of it. Your mileage may vary. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. it's good to experiment. Totally. Like, I, I think what some people don't do is they don't, they think that they've got it under control, mm. but they're not really doing as much preloading or like they haven't really tested salt yeah, to the push the limits. Either. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. To the diarrhea limit um, to see really like how much uh, if it's really if a lot of salt could help them. Also, a scratch has that preload. Hyperhydration mm -hmm. is another yeah. one. Scratch That's does. Osmo does. There, there's a lot of preload options. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you're just looking for a whole heck of a lot of sodium. If you were to take one of those like scratch uh, pre th those ones like the hyperhydration ones, yeah. if you're to do it the night before, is that or I think is that it better to do it might be one of the recommendations. I mean, go to osmonutrition.com yeah. and check it out, or scratch at uh, scratchlabs.com. Yeah, but. Uh, I think they, they, they say they night say before. night before, night before and then yeah. morning of, which yeah. is what I've been. But following. you you have to recognize that you are indeed a salty sweater before you start preloading with products like that because yep. that's a lot of sodium. Yeah, and once again, like you said, experimentation, strips, toilet trips. Well, I just wanted to uh, it's not for it's not for cramps, but I do it uh, just to carry more water on events that I know I'm going to eventually become dehydrated mm -hmm. because it's oh, just yeah. so long and I'm probably not gonna have enough water. So why not hydrate more? I'm looking at you, Leadville. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Uh, Joe says, my A event is in July, and I have a fairly important B event two weeks after that. Beyond that, I have the rest of the summer off. I've heard that it's beneficial to take time completely off the bike after you've peaked. My question covers several parts of this. Is this a good idea? Do I really have to if I don't want to? It's the law. <laughs> yes, the law. Yes, Sorry, you your bike will be locked up. Uh, he says, if I do want to, how long is a good period to do so? Thanks for the great product and podcast. Five stars all around. Yeah. So it's relative to a lot of things. One of them is how much training you've done, how much fatigue you're carrying in, the, the toll that the race itself took on you, what's next. Um, there's there's a lot of factors here. But my, my single bit of advice or most important bit of advice would be just beware hard rules. There are no hard rules. 
you've heard yeah. you're supposed to take a break after you've peaked. Well, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, that's that's a solid rule, but it doesn't apply to everyone all the time. Mm -hmm. So in your case, especially, I mean, if you feel good after you've supposedly peaked, keep going. Maybe you haven't peaked yet. Maybe your peak's going to be an extended one. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe uh, there's just a lot of a lot of reasons for, for you to say, "I feel good. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep on rolling." You don't have to follow any hard set rules. I think it really depends on the races. So we'll have to make some assumptions in this case, you mm -hmm. know, like to, to kind of operate on this one. But for example, so I, I have my situation with nationals, which is the, so my A race is uh, in, is three weeks before Leadville, which one has to treat Leadville as a B race. You can't slot Leadville as a C race, right? It's just such a big day. Um, you really can't do that. So I have my A race of nationals of like totally different demands but then going into Leadville thereafter, I'm certainly not just gonna take time entirely off the bike after nationals. It's not a demanding event in terms of something that will knock me out for a week or something like Leadville, which yeah, will really in, knock in me out. In your case, yes. Yeah, so it, it's a, a, roughly a 90 minute race. It will be all out for 90 minutes at elevation. It will be extremely hard, but I can get back on the bike the next day and continue to train from something like that mm -hmm. versus- See, that's another thing, the amount of training stress to which you've habituated. Yep. You know, am I used to doing this thing in, in frequently? Mm -hmm. I mean, people who build up to an Ironman probably don't do a whole lot of Ironman triathlons in, in a <laughs> short course not. of time. Not, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So in this case, when I'm going from a shorter, more intense event into a really long one, I'm going to continue training, but it's actually just going to be pretty like lower intensity because my goal at that point is I'm just going to try to make sure freshness is high. I'm not going to suddenly transform from an XCO to a long distance, like ultra endurance racer in a few weeks time, which is what I have in this case. And even for a short happen. 90 minute race, you're going to have a big aerobic capacity anyway. Yep. So now you just have to steer it at something that's much longer and you go much easier. Yeah. So I'm probably going to be spending a good amount of time doing sweet spot and tempo and uh, it's a two week gap, a three week gap, three week. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm probably going to be spending a good amount of time doing sweet spot and tempo, not really putting a ton of constraints on that sort of thing. Cause what I find is after I reach a peak, I need a psychological break, um, from that constant. And it's not because in the moment I need the break, maybe, I don't know, but thereafter I find going into the next year that if I give myself a break from that structure for a bit, it really helps me have more motivation for jumping back into things later on. Yeah. And over the course of a three week gap, I don't know that I would worry about anything but muscle endurance considering what Leadville is. Mm -hmm. Cause I mean, you know, Nate, did, did you even have to punch at all at Leadville? Nope. Yeah. It's just a steady effort Kept for a steady. Little, yeah. 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 So why even train, train that stuff during that three week block? There's, right. there's no, there's no real benefit to to be derived, not one that's going to impact your performance at something like that. Yep. Yeah. So now if we flip the tables and say that you have a really long event and then you have an, a short one coming thereafter, uh, could you see some merit in doing some shorter, harder stuff in that three weeks? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And, and just so, I mean, it's a tough one. I mean, if you emerge from that long race and you're just shattered, then I don't know, you're not going to have too much time to do it. Maybe it <laughs> yeah. takes you an entire week to get back on track. But then even during that, that, that middle week, you could do some, some short stuff mm -hmm. and it might not bring, bring about big gains over the course of one week, two weeks out, but it'll probably carry some benefit. Yeah. Even if only psychological, but probably physiological too. That's the biggest thing is, uh, Joe, if, if your A event, it might be a sprint triathlon, it might be a crit or it might be a nine hour race. Mm. It's a nine hour race that you've peaked and you can truly empty yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're gonna need some time off. It took me like a month to get oh, back. Oh yeah. Even oh, just yeah. some like normal daily weeks life. on the light side. But yeah. if it's a sprint triathlon or it's Olympic distance triathlon or a, a crit that's like an hour long, you probably don't need three weeks off. Yeah, um, you're probably good to go. The other thing to say about this is even the longer races, I find that if I have a horrible executed race or a mechanical during it, Mm. The next thing I want to do, I want to race right after that yeah. because, right, like you yeah. feel redemption, redemption, right? And I, I wouldn't psychologically want to have a bad A race where something happened in there that was just, you know, mm. maybe my bolts weren't tight or something like that. <laughs> something um, like that. Something like that. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Could happen to anybody. <laughs> uh, and the next thing you want to do, though, you want to do another race. You don't want to take three weeks off and just say, oh, the rules say I have to do a re yeah, recovery yeah. right now. And Great point. Yeah. So uh, yeah. just if your body's tired, rest. If not, there race. are no rules. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like just, just recommendations. <laughs> like that, Chad. <laughs> Uh, let's go to Dennis's question. He says, Hey guys, love your product and five stars all around. I've been using trainer road since the end of January and just finishing up my sweet spot basement volume program. And it's amazing. I've gone up about 30 Watts in my FTP, just doing sweet spot. 
Nice. Way to go. Keep it up, Dennis. It says, I'm, pre- I'm preparing for my A race that is at the end of June. It is a two-day race consisting of a 30K TT, so it's about 18 miles. We reckon somewhere around 40 minutes. And a 75K road race, which comes out to around 46 miles in roughly, we assume somewhere around two, two hours. hours-ish. Yeah. There is almost no climbing except for some very short, punchy climbs in the road race. And a friend of mine who has done this race says the road races are almost always crit-like and has told me to work with Threshold and VO2 Max. So I'm wondering which build to do, as it seems short power build would be good for that sort of racing that he expects in the road race. However, the 30-kilometer TT is still part of the entire race weekend. So what build program would you suggest to be able to have short, punchy power one day and to be able to crush out a TT the other. And then he says, also on a side note, uh, this is an important thing, this is pretty cool. He says, check out weareprojecthero.org. It's a cycling therapy program for veterans and first responders. It's helped over 10,000 veterans and first responders to date. And one of our most active chapters is located right there in Reno. Awesome. That's awesome. I think all of us have, I mean, certainly we benefit in whatever country you're in for those that have helped support your country, but also all of us cyclists. We need first responders. <laughs> it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, mm-hmm. when you're going to need that sort of a thing. So uh, so thanks for doing that. Uh, back to his question. Uh, he's talking about, his friend says work threshold and VO2 max yeah. for the road race. So, But then again, that's a pretty short TT. Yeah, so it's know? an easy response. Anytime you're straddling or you're, you're um, on the fence between <clears throat> short power or sustained power, mm-hmm. there is a general build which incorporates aspects of both. Which is there you go. pretty much that's it's it. Like we <laughs> Moving on, <laughs> but but in this case, you you also have to recognize just because it, it includes VO two max efforts, it's still a seventy five mile. Uh, 75K, so 46 yeah. mile race, you're gonna be out there for two hours. Yeah. You're not gonna be punching hard over and over and over for two hours. It's, right. it's highly unlikely. Mm-hmm. And you said there's only a few climbs. It's not like a, a constant thing on a short lap. Yeah. So I would still favor muscle endurance over short power, but I would train both. I mean, you're gonna to need to rely on both, so why wouldn't you train both? And yeah. again, that's where the general build splits the difference and accommodates both sides of things pretty well. Where I see this road race shaking out like he says that it's a crit like that sort of thing so in my mind this looks like a breakaway course if it's particularly flat has strategy engine has some sections where you have some punchy climbs so that's a point of the course where decisive things will try to happen and (laughs) keep in mind punchy climbs don't have to be punchy if in the case of a breakaway you're away they're they're as steady as the rest of the ride yeah you you steadily push up it and you steadily push down it and you level back out and keep it steady yep so you know Again, strategy folds into this for sure. In, in my mind, if you train that sustained, more like sustained approach, and one way you could do that, that this is the fun thing. Remember, you're not paid to, to for your results, right? I hope, I mean, maybe you are, Dennis, I don't know. But in this case, if you aren't paid for your result, you could do something like general build, or you mm-hmm. could do something that's like sustained build, and then you could mix it up with a specialty plan that is going to be something that's a little bit more punchy with sustained, or it's you could of, do general. It's kind of hard to go wrong with sustained power, as long as you have good muscle endurance. I mean, yeah. you could even race yourself into a decent level of punchy power. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And the thing is, all it takes is for you to make one decisive move and then hold that dis- hold that steady power, and you're going to be tough to bring in, or you're going to be a really, you know, you're going to be a big asset in any sort of a breakaway. So I, I would favor sustained. I think that a course has to be really climby, kind of like finish on climbs, that sort of a thing, and very undulating the yeah. whole entire course to really favor a person that's truly punchy. The only way I'd push him toward short power in a case like this is if you knew those climbs were decisive. So they came toward the end of the race when each time you hit mm-hmm. one, you're going to shed riders and it finishes on another climb. I'd really yep. emphasize working on that short power. Otherwise, they're too mixed into the course to probably have as big an impact, at least not enough of an impact to steer me toward recommending short power. And they need to be short climbs too, right? If they're 10 minute climbs, it's a totally oh, different. Oh, it's very oh, yeah, different. Totally yeah, different. Yeah, yeah, then climbing. Yeah. We're talking about be minute climbs. Maybe, nine seconds. Yeah, that's something that's maybe even guessing. less, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if he's yeah, making, saying it's similar to a criterium, I'm guessing pretty short. Mm-hmm. And if it's a really short climb, um, we have a video uh, about sad climbing. Mm-hmm. If it's 30 second climb, mm-hmm. even, even a minute even climb, a minute, two minutes. start at the front and Pull then your and then back. work your way back. Just flow back. Don't lose contact. Um, but especially if it's early in a road race, there's probably, there could be a separation there. You can pay attention, but mm-hmm. it just, you can save a whole bunch of energy by doing that. Yep. Martin says, I recently read or heard <clears throat> that it's important to ensure your glutes are firing when you cycle as they are the largest muscle. It made me, that's what he's saying here. He says, it made me realize that, the, that it is my thigh muscles that always hurt when I ride hard, not my glutes. And when he says thigh, I assume that he's talking about his quadriceps. Quads. 
In my next rides, I consciously relaxed my thigh muscles, or quadriceps, and ensured I kept the same power. The major DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness, I had in my glutes a couple days afterwards showed me that this had made the change that I wanted. So he uh, drew the assumption that because he had relaxed those, it required more from his glutes, and the soreness was telling him as much. He says, I may be wrong, but it seemed my actual power output was a bit lower, and this leads to a few questions. Number one. Is it ever a question of 100% glutes or 100% thigh muscles, or is it always a balance? Should we take these one at a time? Um, Do you want to read through them all? Let's read through them and then come back to them. Cool. Number two, how much more power should I expect if I am harnessing my glutes appropriately now? Number three, in the short term, will I see a reduction in power in FTP using my relatively untrained glutes? Number four, should I try and use both glutes and thigh muscles, or will that occur naturally? Love the podcast and the app. I know I improve when I focus on the follow on following the plan. True story there. Yeah. So I really wanted to understand this. Mm. So I, I dug into it and went over six studies, a review, looked into some of the studies in a number of studies in the review. Um, a lot of information here. I'm going to blow through it pretty quickly just to give you the gist of a cool. few of these studies. Um, one of them compared treadmill cycling and stationary turbo cycling. Mm -hmm. They, uh, the, the treadmill favored, I won't even give you the muscle names. There's no point in it. The, the treadmill favored one set of muscles, the turbo favored another set of muscles. So just by riding slightly differently, it shifted the emphasis on different muscle groups. Okay. Um, another one compared hit intensity training to moderate intensity continuous training. They saw greater activation in the, in the glutes. Or again, it just shifted the emphasis. With and, higher intensity. It did, and it showed in this case that high intensity training enhances Glute, glute maximus activation. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, then another one, riding at 70% VO2 max power, three different torso angles. Mm -hmm. So they changed their torso angles each time. That had an influence on when and how, how often, where in the power stroke, the glute max fired. Okay. Interesting also. Um, another one, put mountain bikers on a 10, 20% and a flat grade. So, so the bike angle changed and changes in grade changed muscle activation timing. They hmm. didn't look at the glute maximus, but the fact is changing the bike's position. Hmm. Yeah, that makes change sense. Change activation. On the grade. Except probably, I bet, similar to the previous test, I bet when they changed the grade of the bike, I bet it also changed the rider's position. Probably, relatively. probably, but maybe not. Happens well, to 20%. It's going to have to. Um, <laughs> yeah, 20. Yeah. Else you'll do wheelies. So. And then uh, another one did 250 watts. For all three tests, but they did one at 60 RPM, one at 80 RPM, one at 100 RPM. And this showed that cadence affected the onset and the offset of certain muscle activations. So when they started to kick in, when they started to, to phase out. Mm. Interesting also. Mm -hmm. And then the review showed a lot of things specific to glute maximus and that it's um, it, it, it depends on the work level. It, there's more activation the higher the work level. Well, duh. That, mm -hmm. that makes perfect sense. <laughs> Pedaling rate increased its activation from 40 to 100, but there was a sweet spot right around 90 where it was almost non-existent, where, hmm. where the, the muscle activation was just gone. Interesting. So it's like they'd hit a sweet spot where they didn't, I don't know, for whatever reason, it was all quad intensive at that point. Um, the one where it showed that the glute max was more active in a crouched position versus an upright. So think time trial or criterium in the drops position, more glute involvement than if you're sitting up. I feel that. Riding no, tall. You feel that too? You I feel, feel the opposite. That? Really? So when do I'm, I. So do I. When I'm in a teaching position, I feel it all in my quads yes. and they burn up and my glutes have no Yeah, oh, yeah. maybe that's a saddle yeah. position or a rotation position, your body no. position so to the bike. I think it's usually because my uh, the, the saddle height is too low. And if you get it up really high, that's then I, that's the next one. So they, the, one of these studies in the review said saddle height greatly influences relative mm -hmm. Glute max to vastus uh, media, medius lateralis, so your quads act. So the proportion between those saddle height is the, probably the biggest influence from what I gleaned from this. Yeah, I, uh, one thing to clarify, on my time trial bike, yeah, I feel the same thing as you guys. It's yeah. mostly quad. Okay. Uh, for me, I think that a lot of that is because I'm so forward. And I'm like, you know, my saddle is as far forward as it can go within the rules. And then I'm basically perched on the very end of that thing, sure. right? Um, but I've noticed that on my road bike, if I'm in the tops uh, or on the hoods and then I go down to the drops, I get more... I get more, I've at least perceived activation of my glutes, mm. relatively speaking to that upright position. Okay. So, so if we go back to the questions, is it a question of 100% glutes or 100% thigh muscles, or is it always a bounce? Easy answer, always a bounce. There's mm -hmm. the, you, you can't, the only way you could phase out one or the other would be to extend that, extend your knee completely and lock it, or extend your hip completely and lock it. And mm -hmm. that's not going to happen if you're pedaling a bike. It's not going to happen really if you're doing anything. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not sure you could do that walking without looking like Frankenstein or something, which is pretty unrealistic. <laughs> 
Um, question so two. How much power should he expect if he's harnessing his glutes appropriately? Yeah, so that's, that's something that's super t- um, going to be difficult to quantify. Mm-hmm. Um, far too variable. We just showed all the things that can influence when these, when these muscles innervate, how you know, intensely they, they uh, contribute, mm-hmm. etc. cetera. Um, but there is potential for more contribution to the pedal stroke. So if you're packing around dormant glutes right now because you don't train them, you haven't done any activation, you never do squats or deadlifts or anything that might fi- get them firing, mm-hmm. more muscle mass could lend itself to the pedal stroke, probably will, considering these are the muscles that extend the hips and hip extension takes place, even though it's not a heck of a lot of hip extension when we're folded over on a bike and we're just dropping our knee down. It's not a lot of it, but there is still hip still extension, extension and the glutes drive that. Mm-hmm. Uh, his third question, in the short term, will I see a reduction in power in FTP using my relatively untrained glutes? Almost definitely. And and you see evidence of this when they try to retrain a runner's gait. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, they throw something new at them. It's an entire, it's, it's almost like they're starting from scratch. They have to learn this and then a, 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 um, acquire a new level of running efficiency. And it takes time. Oh, and yeah. the criticism is that, is that it, they never give it enough time. So they, they change a runner's gait, and two weeks later, they haven't improved their efficiency tanks. Well, yeah, it's only been two weeks. Give them two years, then maybe we could fairly assess that. But the point is, who wants to dedicate two years to try and find this tiny little refinement in something that may or may not pay off? I kind of feel like that's what I did, uh, coming back with my knee issues. And, and I've, I pedal on the bike very differently than I used to, mm. um, like almost entirely differently. And I do feel like a lot of activation. It's, it sucks though, to your point. It's, it's not anything that like, I, I absolutely recommend. Well, I don't <clears throat> feel like something I want to clarify too, is just because I use, I feel like, cause I have no data to back this up, but I feel like everything is more balanced ca- across quadriceps and glutes. It doesn't mean that I have unlocked a level of, infi- of, of efficiency that I didn't have before necessarily. Did it change you majorly as a rider? I mean, did no. your power output jump up? Are you not performing? Which is the yeah. big question. My better. knees just don't hurt. And then I can train more, which, yeah, my power is going so up. That, my that's, knees just that's don't an hurt. upside, and we'll talk about that in just a second here. Yeah. So what's that fourth question? Yeah, his fourth question. Should I try and use both glutes and thigh muscles, or will that occur naturally? Uh, it, it occurs naturally already. So yep. it's just that, and, and like we said, the conscious alteration of a change is going to make things difficult, mm-hmm. and that might not pay off in terms of performance benefit. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you are going to address these, and I do recommend that people absolutely get their glutes firing. Mm-hmm. I mean, whether or not you're using them to drive the pedals or simply to stabilize your torso on the bike so that you have better power transfer, so that when you move in and out of the saddle, you're more coordinated, so that you can just basically ride your bike better. You're, you're, you're more balanced. Your body's more capable. For that reason alone, I, I definitely recommend doing this, and I, but I recommend doing it via strength training. Mm-hmm. I mean, you have to do activation exercises where you get in touch with the muscle, then you do strengthening exercises, which actually grows the muscle's capacity, mm-hmm. um, and then just let nature handle the rest. Don't coax your pedal stroke into doing anything it didn't already do. Just oh, yeah. make all the muscles capable of working to a fuller extent and ride your bike. Yeah. Uh, it's, so I, I think another thing that people perhaps misunderstand is that like the glute is the one that pushes the power and that's the one that's really makes you a powerful cyclist. No, if you look at, look at what happens when you push down on a pedal, that's largely knee extension. That's, mm-hmm. that's so driven by the quads. The glutes do fold into it and they fold in at about 12 o'clock down to four o'clock, mm-hmm. but it's not a powerful range of motion for them. Mm-hmm. You're still getting so much of, of what creates power, what puts those Watts on the power meter and, through your quadriceps. I mean, just ask yourself how tired your quads are at the end relative to your glutes. Even with trained glutes that fire, even with someone consciously trying to activate those glutes, getting out of the saddle and really extending their hips, it's still it's still a quad driven movement. I've mentioned this plenty of times that we have a post in the forum about it, uh, about how I am managing my knee issues. You can go on there. There are a bunch of people that have chimed in, talked about things that have helped them. But I worked with uh, Dr. Jay Dashari out of Rebound Physical Therapy up in Bend, Oregon, and he is um, he's a he's a guru <clears throat> of sorts with top athletes and runners especially and managing any sort of imbalances and problems that they have. Mm-hmm. And, uh, he was just saying like, uh, look, man, I I want your glutes to work, but I don't want them to work because they need to drive the pedals. He's Mm. like, I want them to work because they need to stabilize things. Yeah. And that's it. I mean, the whole glute complex, the, the, the maximus medius Mm -hmm. and minimus, they're very much about stabilization. I mean, Mm -hmm. less so with the maximus that that's definitely about hip extension and and, and movement. Yeah. But the, the other two muscles are, are very much about making your, your knee track well, keeping your hip, 
yeah. in its place, keeping your pelvis situated uh, and basically providing stability for the muscles that do the prime movers, which to some extent are the glutes, but yeah. to a far greater extent are the quads. Yeah. And he said, you know, you've spent years where your glutes are doing that job and said, or sorry, where your quads are doing that job. You get overcompensation with muscles that aren't supposed to be yeah. doing what the glutes, the inactive glutes aren't doing. Yeah. So, you know, I have like four different quadricep muscles and because things aren't stable, you've got them pulling unevenly because they're trying to stabilize things as you're pedaling pulls the kneecap crooked, makes tracking yeah. issues happen, plenty of things. And, and for that reason, yes, absolutely train your glutes. But yeah. if you're looking for a more strong or for a stronger pedal stroke, you know, any in improvement you get with more active glutes, I, I'm not entirely sure it'll be because the glutes are stronger so much as they're doing their job better. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. Um, we're going to jump ahead in our doc here. We're going to go to Jesse's question. Uh, it says, Hey guys, I assume it's common to switch cadences around during an interval. This is kind of online with what we're talking about in some respects here mm -hmm. as one system fatigues. What are the benefits or downsides to starting with low cadence and fatigue? And he says, forgive me, fatiguing fast twitch and then switching to high cadence and slow twitch muscles versus starting with high cadence and switching to low cadence as the interval progresses. So I, by the way, and I just want to clarify, because that was, that's a bit confusing if you're just listening to that, but basically we're talking about during an interval, switching from your, you know, going from a low cadence to a high cadence or vice versa. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice that you naturally do this. If you're on a really long climb, something like that, you'll notice that at times, you know, you'll pass the load off to, from <clears> one <throat> side of the scale to the other, so to speak, and you'll yeah. be doing low cadence, higher force, or then you'll be switching to doing higher cadence and less force. A lot of times it's just a product of fatigue. You start yeah. out at 90 RPM and as you fatigue, it falls to 88, 85, 84, 80. Happens. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the question, is there an important benefit to keeping consistent cadence for an entire interval? I tend to start my intervals around 85 RPM until my legs are gassed, then switch to 95 to hundred RPM, the last minutes of an interval and try to max my in quotes, cardio system. Thanks trainer road team for the great podcast app and support. Yeah. So not really. I mean, it's not like you're going to derive any obvious benefit from switching your cadence up during an interval. It's really the, the workouts and then the difficulty of the intervals will influence what's required. I mean, even if you wanted to do some really slow force work where you're pedaling at 50, 60 RPM, if you're doing 120% repeats, good luck making that happen. Yeah. So a lot of the times you'll be forced into a cadence that suits the demands anyway. You won't even have to think about it. Yeah. Um, and, and then when it comes to just, just using your slow twitch fibers, you can really only do that with a low intensity workout. You're not going to be able to create that much force. So it, that kind of handles itself already. Mm -hmm. um, I do like the idea of rider flexibility in all cases. Yeah. I mean, you know, like with the road racing question, short power or sustained power, both, absolutely both road racers need to be flexible and bike riders in, in general need to be flexible in terms of cadence, in terms of a lot of things. But in, in the case of this question, cadence you need to be able to comfortable, be comfortable with spinning hundred plus RPM for sustained periods of time, be comfortable muscling it at 60 RPMs for sustained periods of time, you know, mm -hmm. all contextual, of course. Mm -hmm. Um, and then a, a lot of the interval workouts kind of handle this for you too, in that I'll, I'll put the high intensity work at the beginning of the workout, because mm -hmm. that's when you need your, your freshness. Mm -hmm. And then we'll tack on the endurance work at the end of it. Mm -hmm. It's not to say you couldn't flip flop that and do some endurance work and then finish it with some high intensity work because you know, that's what your races are going to demand of you. Mm -hmm. So, so again, I mean, it, it, this is a question that sort of answers itself. Yeah. And Nate, you like to. I mean, you, you are a one trick pony in the sense that you can only pedal at a single cadence, but I know that in the majority of your work, you, you keep a pretty high cadence, mm -hmm. right? Is that, is that fair to say? Yep. Yeah. But you also, I assume whether it's just from the racing, that sort of stuff, you don't find yourself. Do you feel like that hurts you when you get into no, race on, environments? On the trainer, I'm doing a higher cadence stuff. And then I never, I don't even display cadence when I'm racing. Cause I think Same. that's one of, it's like heart rate. It just gets into your head and you're like, Oh, this is my regular cadence. I can't do this. Yeah, or yeah. I just do whatever it happens. And you look at the race files afterwards. It's like, Hey, you operate at 80 cadence here and 90 and you were fine yep. and everything yeah. like it's, it worked. And yeah. same with heart rate. Well, you operate at a higher heart rate or a lower heart rate yeah. and it yeah. doesn't really matter. And the extremes seldom pan out favorably. Mm -hmm. I, I've done road races, three hour road races where I just locked into a fast cadence. And by it came, by the time I got down to the last 15, 20 minutes, I had done so much spinning that my muscles just locked up any times. I, <laughs> anytime I tried to really push out some power. Yeah. I mean, in the same case, the same idea, if you do a sustained climb and you don't have the gearing for it and you're stuck in a low cadence for a long period, performance is probably just going to, just going to deteriorate over the, the ending of whatever that is, a race or a ride. 
Yeah, I, I mix it up regularly in my workouts, but part of that is, uh, so there's a couple reasons. Number one, I don't want to be just locked into one spot. Um, I like to, especially because of mountain biking. Mountain bikers especially. You get pushed into spots where you're going really fast on a wide open section. You've got to spin at 130 RPM, and you've got to be able to put out power at that speed, not just be able to spin. That's a totally different deal. Mm -hmm. Or you have to spin it at 50 is. RPM, right? And that's just kind of how it works. But then on top of that, too, I find that it's a great way, like let's say you have six intervals, and it's a, it's a fun way to do your self-selected cadence at first, then on the next one, you'll see this a lot of the time in the workout text that Chad has written to then on the next interval, especially like in sweet spot base, that sort of a stuff, mm -hmm. uh, that sort of, or those sort of workouts to experiment with a lower cadence. Yeah. Cause first off, I don't want one. people to lock into any one particular cadence. It's mm -hmm. something that they just gravitate to all the time, even when it's not appropriate, but also I, I want to keep those a little interesting and I want them to see, you know, maybe when I spin at 85 versus 95, I actually feel a little fresher or yeah. vice versa. Maybe 95 suits me. Um, but I want, it's, it's kind of a process of self-discovery that I'm yep. walking people through. Absolutely. Uh, and as far as it, if it's bad to, you know, swap the load, so to speak, to go from low to high or high to low in terms of your cadence, it's totally natural. Yeah. That just is what it is. So, uh, okay. Uh, last one, uh, that we're going to take this time. Uh, actually we may squeeze in one more, but this one is from cat three memes. Uh, it's his <laughs> mother given name. I'm sure. So <laughs> says, Hey guys, thanks for the great podcast. I'm sure you've addressed this before, probably multiple times, but I'm too lazy to go back and search. And I like hearing my name read on air. So I'll just ask it again. <laughs> cat three memes. Cat three memes is like I said, mother given name. I'm currently recovering after fracturing my pelvis in a crit on February 3rd. If any of you guys want to see this in action, you can go to his profile and he is doing an amazing scorpion on his face across the finish oh. line. So mm -hmm. says, uh, for context, I was quite fit at the time and was about three months into serious training when I crashed. I was off my left leg completely for six weeks. And after a week of joyous walking, I've gradually started experimenting on the trainer again. My questions thus regard how to proceed training after a serious injury. I'm feeling better than I expected, and I want to start on some gentle intervals already. Obviously, my power zones from seven weeks ago are way off, but I'm hesitant to immediately test my FTP as after such a long break, I'm seeing obvious gains almost every ride now, and I imagine my results would be obsolete in about a week. What's the best way to proceed? I've been doing some self-guided efforts at what feels like steady state because junk miles are boring. He says, but I'm not sure whether to assume I'm back at the beginning of base training or somewhere in between. I also don't want to push myself too hard too soon or conversely, not hard enough. Anyways, thanks again. And he says, buy some socks. He, he has socks. Um, <laughs> so the, the other thing I want to cover with this is when he's been getting back on the bike, he's been like saddle testing. He broke his pelvis, right? So he's trying to find one that's like very comfortable for now. Um, so he's been like saddle testing. He hasn't been doing anything that's, you know, really severe. Uh, but I, I think that this is an interesting point, right? Cause you don't want to just, if you're coming back from injury and you know, you're going to see a lot of improvements mm. and also coming back from injury, the first workout you want to do after fracturing your pelvis probably isn't one where you're going to be doing a maximal effort. Definitely not. <laughs> not. <laughs> so I wouldn't recommend doing it. Uh, Nate, you kind of feel the same on this, right? Yeah. Uh, when I broke my collarbone, I kind of just self-adjusted and I like the difference between Sweet spot is really hard. So aerobic work, that's the easiest to start with. And you just dial it down. And then some shorter on-off VO2 max work like uh, Bluebell or Taylor or Gendarm. Um, the, the threshold stuff was extremely hard. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. I, I, I agree. Like I would just, you know, dial it down and then self-adjust up mm -hmm. until you're kind of back and rides feel more normal. And then test because you are like it, it will be almost ride to ride. Or yeah. every three days, like you're gaining five watts. So there's no, you don't want to put yourself through that ramp test and then mm -hmm. stick to it after when, you know, three days <laughs> from now, it's going to be obsolete. And yeah. you're going to, your body's responding differently too. So it yeah. might take longer or yeah. you might find that after two days, you get smashed for another four days mm -hmm. and everything. Mm -hmm. You got to really listen to yourself. Yeah. Your rate of recovery and what's your rate of healing? We don't know how quickly that bone's going to mend. So the last thing I would do is get on and put out any serious effort on a broken pelvis of all things. Yeah. That's yeah. So I absolutely err on the side of caution, but you don't have to assess to, to know what you're capable of. You get on the bike, start turning those pedals out of you'll, I mean, you'll know, you know when it hurts. That's too far. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, anything in the initial stages is great. I yeah. mean, just like I had knee surgery, just getting on the bike, putting the seat, seat post way up because the knee was so swollen. I couldn't, you know, really it flex it very well. Yeah. Um, just, just took it easy, led my bike classes while everyone else did their workout. And just as the days rolled by, I could put a little more pressure on, I could bring my saddle down a little bit and I just 
gracefully, gradually transition back into being able to do work. Mm -hmm. I, I think, so that's exactly what I did when I was coming back from the knee injury. I, I basically just did a free ride and I, on, on trainer road and I was just pedaling and I was just slowly letting myself kind of raise up through. And I got to 240 Watts and I was like, Oh man, I'm, I'm out of breath. And I feel like I just hit that inflection point. Like I'm loading up. <laughs> So I swallowed my ego and I dropped that down to where it was because, you know, I had dropped from, you know, I felt like I had fallen from such great heights, mm -hmm. but it's a number. And remember, your goal is to get specific training. So really just let that be a number. Don't let and, it be any sort and of. And during this period, you're not chasing performance no, improvement. You're, you're in the midst of the healing process. So make sure your priorities are, are straight. That's right. And then thereafter, I just kept up, upping it when I felt like it. And then after, I think, a month and a half of doing that, then I felt, I was like, yeah, I'm okay to try a ramp test. And then I did a ramp test and, you know, I've ramp tested since then. And then I continue to self-adjust when I feel like it's not as high or I may take a ramp test, that sort of a thing. We talked about that, I think, on last week's episode. But, you know, it takes definitely some uh, some knowledge of your body and your performance to kind of self-adjust without getting yourself into a bad situation. So that's the benefit of the ramp test being so easy to do. But in this scenario, when you're coming back from injury, yeah, just start out and be gentle on yourself mm -hmm. uh, because things will come back. You'll, you'll get back to be where patient. you need to be. Mm -hmm. uh, let's fit in one more. Uh, this one's from Cunio says, hi guys, I have a question on cornering technique and crit racing. I've recently joined short crit, short, a uh, short circuit crit that contains two 180 degree corners. I wonder what is the good technique to keep my position in such a crit course. So this is what we were talking about with a hot dog, hot crit, dog. right? And mm -hmm. when we say hot dog crit, it looks like a hot dog. So that's, if that helps this is you guys. happen at Sea Otter. Exactly right. Yeah. It will. It says, as far as I've observed, the pack usually slows down to prepare for that 180 degree corner. Then after that, everyone is sprinting to keep or change their position. And the reason this happens and what makes it uh, different than an oval is a hot dog crit generally has like a hairpin tight 180 that you really have to slow down for. It's like a mm -hmm. U-turn is what we're talking about rather than just a 100, 180 degree broad turn where you can keep speed. You do have to slow down. Since I'm heavy compared to other people, I want to keep momentum as much as possible. But in such a crit course, it feels impossible to do that. Yeah, you, you genuinely do get rid of your momentum. Depends every on turn. how tight the turn is, but yeah. yeah. Uh, he says, do you have any tips for, or advice for such a crit course, especially cornering technique? Uh, so thanks guys. Love your podcast. Um, so yeah, this is exactly what you'll be facing. Now this may be different than this course. Uh, let's just take the sea otter course. Uh, I'm not doing that crit, but it's basically, it's got those tight one eighties. You basically go up the actual start finish line at Laguna Seca. You go on that straightaway, and then you do a U-turn with pit lane there, and then you end up coming back on the same start-finish so straightaway. It's very broad, yeah. Yeah, um, very tight turn. Oh, it is tight. Very tight turn. No, well, the turn's tight. It's 180, but how big's the lane? Oh, yeah. It's it's plenty of room. I would say it's, it's a race course, a car race course split in half. Okay. So it does get tight in the turns, so you can't go through the turn like eight wide or anything like that. It gets tight in the turns, and it slows down a lot. But the tricky thing about the course that you'll face there, Nate, is the fact that the whole thing, every lap, you have a climb and a descent because halfway through that hot dog, you reach the apex of a climb. And it's not like anything that's crazy steep, but it, you're just constantly on a grade one way or the other. Uh, so it makes it pretty tough because you have constant acceleration, basically two times a lap where you have to accelerate back up to race speed, but you have to do that on a climb every time. Uh, Any idea how long? Yuck. So. <laughs> Any idea how long the laps take? Uh, not very long. I would say that a lap. Two, three minutes? No. I would say that a lap probably takes somewhere on at two or just under two. Oh, geez. So you're going to be doing a lot of. I mean, based on the category, you're going to yeah. be doing a lot of accelerations. Yes. Yeah. So with these sort of things, I guess the. the, the one, you can't really hide in a race like this. Uh, you're kind of exposed because of the fact that you have to accelerate that many times. Mm -hmm. So your fitness will definitely, it will definitely shine. In this case, a power to weight ratio will also come forward since you're dealing with climbing every lap as well. Yeah. Um, stay up front. Yeah. Seriously stay up front because the farther back you are, we know this happens with any turn. The farther back you are, the more magnified the effect, and the more you have to slow down. Yo -yo in effect. the case of a 180, you'll come to a standstill. I mean, mm -hmm. if the field's big enough, by the time you get about midfield and a little farther back, you you could literally be doing a track stand, just sitting there with no speed whatsoever. Yes. And so then stay the, up front and try to carry some speed. The acceleration you have to do after that is going to be so much harder. Than Pay attention you to your gearing too, depending on where you are in the field and how, how much you know, how drastically it's going to slow by the time you get to reaccelerate. Make sure you're not caught in a big gear. 
Yes. Yeah. No. So you won't have to drop into your little chain ring ever on this one, uh, especially because you have the 12 speed sweet uh, uh, deal on that. But I think that the other thing with this is you have to come into these races. So once again, you have to position yourself toward the front, but I find psychologically speaking, you can use workouts like microburst workouts that you've done and tell yourself, I've done something like this before because mm -hmm. it may feel foreign, but when you're in that moment of having to accelerate constantly, it does not feel easy for a single person in there. I yeah. promise you. And it's, a, it's not just big power either. It's not uh -huh. just about being able to create big power. It's be able to generate big power really quickly. You yes. have to go from very low speed to very high speed, which means a big change in power and it has to be done in a really narrow length of time. Yep. I don't, I haven't seen many breakaways get away on that criterium course before, just because usually everyone is trying everything they can just to stay up with whatever pace it is. And I wouldn't call it a breakaway, but the field just shatters basically, you know, and guys are way back, but it's not because riders were able to like, you know, increase their speed relative to the pack necessarily. Yeah. It's just a thing of attrition. It's only so much time to get away before you have to slow down and turn exactly again. right. Yeah. So is it the a separation happens with all the accelerations and yeah. after 45 accelerations, just you're just like, people, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would expect yeah. too, to your yeah. point, Chad, then gaps open up bigger. If you're farther back, you have to cover those gaps yeah. Yeah, because yeah. people are breaking. And it's usually, uh, Laguna Seca is a pretty windy place. Uh, it's not crazy windy, but it's just closer to the coast. And you have this, uh, every morning it's like a fog layer that sits over you, then it blows off. So that mm -hmm. always comes with some wind because of the pressure change. So ideally sit close to the front and then be prepared. Sometimes you're going to be in front, so don't be afraid of working. Don't try to hide a few riders back the entire time. Do your, do your fair share of work too. Yeah, absolutely. Hot dog crits, if you're the sort of rider that, let's say if it's like a flat course, but you know that you are really good at punching and you have a big FTP, that sort of a thing, uh, hot dog crits can be good. Uh, if they're a hot dog crit with a climb like this, and you know that you have a favorable power to weight ratio and you can punch a lot, they can be good too. Uh, but they're not usually what a traditional crit rider likes to Sounds more target. like a circuit almost. Yep. Short circuit. Yeah. The other thing I would say that I'm working on still, but, but I've seen the videos that I'm bad at, is pedal out of the corner as soon as you can um, without pedal striking. Yes. Because just those two extra pedal strokes at... Mm -hmm let's say 300 watts, uh -huh. that gives you an extra bike length that you don't have to cover. Yes. Um, and the best riders do that. They pedal out a lot earlier, and I'm scared. I've clipped my pedal before yeah. um, of doing that, so I wait too long, and then I have to do more power to accelerate. And you can get a feel for that by pedaling softly for the first couple of revolutions, yep. so that if you do catch a pedal, it's not, not enough to vault your bike. Rather, you just bang the pedal, yep. and it pops right back up. So yep. you can get a feel for when it's safe to start pedaling again. Yeah, that's, that's a, a great good, point. Yeah, and you do that once, and then you kind of know, mm -hmm. especially because you're doing this. It's like a depth charge. Exactly. You're doing that because you, uh, you're doing this course so many times. You're going to yeah. get really good at that corner, yeah. and you're going to get really good at knowing when to pedal. And, when and different to. situations, though, you'll enter that corner with a little more speed, which means you'll probably come out of it with a little more speed depending on your position. So what may have worked previously at lower speeds may not work now. The bike may be leaned over a little more. Maybe you pedal softly for the first three revolutions instead of the first two uh, rather than risk catching that pedal. Yeah, absolutely. The The other thing I would say, so the, the, the cool part and just some mechanics on how that works really is when you're jamming hard on those pedals, like mm -hmm. you have, <clears throat> forgive me, so much pressure in between there and your pelvis that you actually kind of lock up as a unit. It's hard to get that bike body separation, bike shifts. but when you're softly pedaling like that, it allows you to get a ton of bike body separation. So your bike can get a little upset, but your body's fine because you're not just jamming into those pedals. What about, um, to take the line into the 180? Mm -hmm. I mean, just should I do it just flow with it or should I go, should this person? If it's spread too? out, you're going to be locked into your position. So yes. unless it's strung out, then, and, and even then you'll probably follow the wheel that's in front of you. Most people do. Yeah. You'll, you'll, you'll find the line naturally. Sure. But you're really the majority of the time, I'm sure you're just going to be in a bunch. I'm taking the line that is fed to me. Yeah, by but if bunch. it strings out and you can, you know, enter yeah. wide, exit, exit wide. That's, that's what I would, well, or even do a uh, enter wide late apex because that would allow me to yes, accelerate late apex. for the longest amount of time. Yep. Yeah. Um, like to, to kind of smooth that out. Yeah. Explain that. So that means um, you're going to have the sharpest part of the turn like early in the turn. So I'm going to go mm -hmm. wide and I'm not going to turn, not going to turn. I'm going to do all the turning at once and then I'm going to have a really long exit. Right. And sometimes you can go around people in that too. Sometimes it's bad though. Jonathan's going to tell me why it's bad right yeah. now. Well, they, they, <laughs> yeah. they had a, a competition years back 
and Brian Lopes, who, you know, he's a mountain biker and a mm -hmm. BMX rider, but he did this on a road bike. It was a, a timed descent and he schooled people. Oh, that was that Red and, Bull thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, don't I remember that. I don't even remember. <laughs> I just remember the one takeaway that really, really hit home for me was he waited a microsecond longer before executing his turn. So, so rather than enter the turn, you know, you, you see the, the wide entry, the wide exit, you, you have you, basically you do it like you always do it. He would just make himself wait half a second longer and it would help him carry exponentially more speed well, probably not exponentially but a heck of a lot more speed yeah just by slightly delaying his his uh his turn committing to the turn mm -hmm. and i've applied that i don't know how many times since then and man does it make a huge difference nevada city is a great course for that yeah like i think that the main thing is you don't want to whatever your speed is your speed will define how tight of an apex you can maintain through a turn uh, and that you may try to get all the turning done in one point or another. But in my mind, if you are squeezing more of your turning into a portion of that turn mm -hmm. and then leaving uh, for a straighter line thereafter, I don't think that that's the smartest way to do it. I think that you should match your speed to the tightest possible apex. And if that's the case, that tightest possible apex is going to be from the beginning of the turn to the end of the turn. In other words, like you won't be able to get the majority done, then straighten out through the turn. If you've done that, you could have gone way faster through mm -hmm. that turn. So in my mind, you want to have just like what Brian Lopes is talking about. He's not talking about squeezing more of the apex in at a different point. Mm -mm. He's talking about just giving himself more room. So he's sitting wide and waiting. So then he can roll into that turn and keep that, keep that. Apex and that's it. It's, it's still that wide entry. You just hang on to mm -hmm. it a little longer than you normally would. Yep. Exactly. Right. And it's because your body always wants to turn in earlier than you think. Yeah. Right. Uh, but you yeah. can it's, keep it going and, and make it it's work. It's pretty illuminating. Once you get in touch with it, you do it a couple times. It, it, it's a game changer. That event was crazy. I just want to close on that really quick. It, Red Bull did an event descending down a Canyon in Malibu on road bikes. Mm. And that was the race. Like, who could go down a road descent as fast as possible? And I think That's they squashed that pretty Dangerous quick. business. That's they like probably, Strava downhill segments. Yeah, Those they are probably gone. realized that was not going to end up, end up well. Um, cool. Very, very good. So uh, we also do this podcast live every Thursday at 8 a.m. Pacific is usually the time that we do it. Uh, and this week, that's the case. Uh, once again, for the next two weeks, we're not going to, but you can join us on Facebook or YouTube. And we usually take a few questions from people uh, that have submitted them through those channels. Uh, I have one really ahead, quick. Yep. <clears throat> and this one, once again, Nate, it may trigger you, but it says, how much better are ceramic bearings considering their continuous use with every cadence? Do you think it adds up at last? So I think that the, what you're meaning, Rajesh, on this one is, so first of all, how much better are ceramic bearings? We have ceramic, I did like a back-to-back -back comparison on a ceramic BB versus like a normal bottom bracket. The ceramic BBs do spin easier, definitely. Um, they don't necessarily, when people say they last longer, that doesn't necessarily mean because, you know, ceramic doesn't inherently last longer. Um, it usually just means that, you know, if there's less friction, that sort of thing, but also usually ceramic bottom brackets are more expensive. The tolerances are also tighter. It's just a better made thing. Like I've seen people with ceramic speed stuff after years and they spin it and it just continues to Do spin. riders see a performance benefit from doing, Ooh, I don't even know how you measure how much less power you have to put into no, it. No, no. Yeah. So ceramic speed, um, they, they themselves say that like a bottom bracket is less than a watt. Yeah. Mm. So there you go. It's not very less much. than one, watt. less than one watt. That's yeah. assuming a properly installed bottom bracket, meaning that like, you know, it's not grinding or not too tight and causing any problems like that. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you actually have a bottom bracket that's not working very well right now. Correct, Nate? Yeah. It's all crunchy. We had to <laughs> more problems. This is very true to me, right? So it's yeah. 12 speed access. Suppose I got, I got the D, the D dub. What's it mm. called? Dub? No, it's dub. dub. The dub. new SRAM bottom bracket yeah. that they've switched to. So we had to hammer out the very expensive ceramic speed bottom bracket Oof. and mm -hmm. put in this one. And now it's crunchy and I've got races. I'm leaving in two days for a trip um, and I need someone <laughs> yeah. named Jonathan Lee to help me. But uh, I can feel it while I'm pedaling. Mm. That's uh, bad. Yeah. And even uh, so those ra that race I lost by quarter wheel, I was on that little crunchy bottom bracket. <laughs> I think Specialized uh, has been known for having creaky bottom brackets in the past. And these bottom brackets were installed in our frames when we got them. And I feel like they used like basically like un, unending cement to, to get these bottom brackets to not creak. Oh. So it took a lot of pounding to get them out. That's what we were talking about. On yeah. The bench. So, so. Anyway, so now it's, I need this fixed right away. Sure. We will fix sure. it. So if you have a, if you, if you, you spin it and it's, you feel resistance, that's, that's bad. bad. Yeah. Or <laughs> that's if you, you get. 
If yeah. you spin your crank and it goes around once and stops, that's mm-hmm. bad. Yep. You, a good one, it kind of goes zzzz, yep. and, and, and you're, you're good. Uh, Aaron says, what's the best data? We get this question quite a lot. What are the best data fields to show on your Garmin or Wahoo head unit during a road race and a mountain bike race? I don't have a power meter on my mountain bike, so would this affect your field choice? Uh, so I have on my mountain bikes, uh, or so for my mountain bike profile, I just have a watch and I never look at it the whole race. I don't, uh, for a mountain bike race, unless it's time. Lego. Uh, no, because I've laps for oh, cross yeah. country Olympic. Right. And that's really easy to figure that out. Um, but for Leadville, that's a different story. Um, for something like that, that's longer. I'm going to have my normalized power. I'm going to have the kilojoules that I'm burning and I'm going to have time. And probably your five second power. Oh uh, yes. Yeah. Five yeah. second power. I always have that at the top of whatever yeah. data field I have. Five yeah. second power. Is if, I, up there. if I didn't have power, just be time and speed most yep. likely. And I like to see the grade. It's interesting, but time is the, I can never not have time. I just have to know if I, if this is a 50 minute crit, how far into that 50 minutes am I right now? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, that's my main screen. And then on a, on a road race thing. Yeah. I have a lap time. That's, that's crucial. Um, it, but then I, that's my main screen. And then I have countless screens that you can not countless, but I have a handful of screens that you can swipe through. And one of them will have like all the elevation data that you would have. Cause then when you're on a long day where like, you know, it's not like a race sort on of a effort, long day, yeah. uh, then it's fun to talk with Morphe your friends screens. and see what you've done uh, and that sort of thing. I even have like a, uh, I call it uh, my, my wife screen and it's the sort of information that I want to give my wife when I call her <laughs> from a ride and it's a long day. So that's like how long I've been riding in my average speed. And then I have like the temperature, I have the, that sort of stuff. So then I can be, my like, wife cares about none of that. <laughs> she doesn't care about the temperature, but here's what I'm getting no, at. Time you're going to be home. <laughs> here's, that's exactly it. It's, it's to help me figure out when I'm going to be home. And then when I see that sort of information, it makes me make the decision. Okay. It's now 32 degrees and it's dropping. I am going to get home sooner. That sort of sooner, that sort of thing. So that's my uh, responsibility page. Jeff has a good tip with uh, short pedal wrench and get a, bring a PVC pipe with the di- diameter big enough to go over the, the, the wrench to get more leverage oh. when you're um, oh, doing yeah. a pedal wrench on the trip. That's a good idea. And also, too, if you can't find a short pedal wrench, you can just use a crescent wrench. Um, sure. yeah. Get like a go to Home Depot or Lowe's that, that's short enough and not it can't be too wide. Yeah, it's it totally depends on the pedal because some cases, I don't know on the vectors, but um, some pedals, <clears throat> and when you take off the gym bike pedals, for example, <clears throat> forgive me, some of them only have a slot wide enough for a pedal wrench. Yeah. So you can't use. So you got to get some, and you might even you what can, like a cone wrench, yeah, like a short cone, cone wrench is, with a PVC yeah. pipe could work. Oh, sure. Maybe. That's what I should, yeah. I'll probably. I'm, I'm about to go. Cone wrench is yeah. strong. To Garmin for their IQ conference, and I'll yeah. probably bring a cone wrench because I want to carry on. Multi multi tools. Some multi tools have a pedal wrench in them. It doesn't give you a ton of leverage, but once again, you can use that. that yeah, pipe that's a good idea want, too. You know, uh, so that's also an option. Um, let's see. Somebody's talking about how tough it would be to uh, switch pedals at a gym, at a gym, and other people are very impressed that Chad took his jacket off. Uh, Every time I'm impressed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what would be a better power pacing plan for a 45 minute TT effort? 105 percent down to 95 to 100 percent, back up to 105 percent. So in other words, like that J or the subtle smile. Forgive yeah. me. Or his second option: 95 to 100 to 105. And he says, start to finish. So basically starting out at 95 and doing a negative split where you finish faster. Mm-hmm. And then the third option, 105% and hang on for dear life. <laughs> Not that. <laughs> yeah, that one Not that. Well. <laughs> the other two is, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I, both are uh, valid pacing approaches. I think usually they say, I mean, it, it really depends in one. some cases on, on wind and all that stuff on where you may just be yeah, forced yeah, yeah. even above sure. your threshold. Yeah. But assuming that that isn't rolling terrain or not, mm-hmm. yeah. assuming that isn't the case, uh, I think that they usually, I mean, a negative split is usually a faster way to do it yeah. for some people. Power might not, it might not make it a negative split. I mean, mm-hmm. 95 with a tailwind, 105 with a headwind, you could In be putting out more power, less yeah. speed or less time speed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is an interesting thing is uh, I remember, uh, I think Ross, I forget his name. He studied under, um, Noakes, but he's a, he's a very famous, uh, sports, uh, physiology person. Mm. Uh, Dr. last name Ross. No, first name Ross. I forget. But he wrote something saying that virtually every world record has set with a negative split. Mm. I think that tells you something Yep. Uh, about how to pace TTs and stuff, and which is the hardest to do, right? It is. I've, I never, 
I think I've done it once in my life and it was really great. We're uh, always it, eager and ready to go in the beginning. We always think we're stronger than we yeah, are yeah. Uh, every time. It's seldom if ever uh, the best way to go. Yesterday mm -hmm. I did like a 36 minutes at threshold uh, up a climb and I did the subtle smile. It, like uh, I wanted to be more consistent, but it was a subtle smile. So uh, uh, you got one? Yeah. Grant um, said, if my frame allows, should I consider 28 millimeter tires? I don't plan on racing on 28 millimeter tires on my TT bike. I have 23 millimeter tubulars on which I fire up to 160 PSI. Oh my gosh. That's, that's why terrifying. I wanted to read this. That's that is terrifying. Um, Ross Tucker. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. Yeah. Ross Tucker. That's it. Uh, so Grant, 160. Uh, I don't know any tires that go up to that high, 23, <laughs> but don't do that. I like, would not do that. Even I think if it says. Some tubulars do, though. Some tubulars really? do yeah. go really high. It's crazy do high they, pressure. It blows my mind. It's like it's 180, it's, I think, for track. track here's TVs. the thing, though. It doesn't mean that it's actually faster. Yeah, exactly. Like, it's what say. they no, do because that's what tradition says, but it doesn't mean that it's faster. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you can look online. They have rolling resistance tests, and there's like this valley where you go lower, <clears> and it's, it's a lot smoother. Um, you don't get so much of that bumping up and down. And you actually go faster. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and as far as pacing, we have yet to mention Best Bike Split, which is always. Oh yeah. oh yeah. Yes. Absolutely. And if you look at Best Bike Split, in most cases, it has you, it it shows an ideal, and it's like. So man, exactly what to do. Keep that thing steady. So. So for ch tire width choice, um, it's going to be matter on how wide your rims are. So this is this is how I do it. Is I go for twenty sixes on the NB five six because that that those mate really well and they're arrow and they're pretty wide. Mm -hmm. I would never go any lower than that on those rims because it's, it's in like a narrower tire. You're yeah, like a twenty three yeah, no. because uh, if you're you don't get any benefit from going if your tire is like more narrow than your rim. You want to have that mate pretty well. Yep. For and training, you're talking about the profile, the width profile from the sides of the tire to the sides of the rim. Yes, um, and then for training, twenty eights feel amazing. Um, when we went to Hawaii, we did 28s mm -hmm. the whole time. I love those. But then yeah. also Northern California best. races that have, um, uh, they're really uh, bad roads. Chattery and I think, road service. Yeah, Sea Otter is going to be the same way. Um, I also think that, I don't know if it's true, but I feel like 28s are a little better for flat protection mm -hmm. than a 26. So on those races where honestly, like it seems like 25% of the field get a flat, mm. I'm totally do 28s on, mm -hmm. um, even if, even though you're losing a little aerodynamic advantage, the, the lower, the rolling resistance is probably going to be better on those bumpy roads with a little bit wider tires, just like sure. they are in mountain biking. Yep. Um, and you're going to feel better. You're going to be more rested and you're probably going to have less likely a chance to get a flat. I run 60 PSI in my 26s the specialized 26s because wow. they, I think they measure a little wider than 60. 26. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I run 60 PSI with my MV five sixes. Wow. So, and it, it's recommended that I do 58 to 61 and 60 is where I sat. Hmm. And that's a cool thing that they do is they actually show you per the width of your tire and per the weight of Body the rider, weight. they like sh suggest what you should have. Where do you find that? Uh, that's on their website. Yeah. On the NV's website. But once again, that's for their wheels. It depends on internal width and they may not be designed to hold a bead with that little pressure, whatever wheel you ride, but these ones are. So that's kind of an important thing, but man, it makes riding so much better when you have like a higher volume tire at lower pressure. It's mm -hmm. just incredible. I absolutely. It's like a new it. bike. Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, Jason Peterson says, and this one, or Pedersen, I'm not sure how you pronounce that, but uh, this one will cut close for Brandon, our product manager says, I race San Dimas stage race off of sweet spot base mid volume two, and then general build mid volume. It went well. I won the cat two race and beat Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> he says, Brandon made me work. I think they know each other from back in their triathlon days. Yeah, I think. I think he said yep. that. Mm -hmm. So good job, Jason. Yeah, You're congrats. really fast. He says, I have about four weeks until Belgian waffle ride now. What plan do you recommend I squeeze in between this? So once this kind of relates back to what we were talking about before, it depends on how fatigued you are from San Dimas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you are really fatigued from something like that, I think you're climbing a rolling road race. I was yes. going to say four weeks century. Cause it's yeah. really just like century is a lot of FTP building. Yeah. 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 I, I don't know. I've Belgian done Belgian pretty, pretty it's, varied. Though, oh yeah. Isn't it's it? varied. Yeah. yeah. And you I have really long breakaway. climbs. Yeah. No, I mean, it's long climbs. Yeah. Long climbs. The, if I would do one of the four climb. weeks of the first four weeks of one of the road race plans, climbing yeah. or or rolling. I would pick climbing if you feel that uh, sustained power is a relative weakness in your game. I would pick rolling road race if you feel like rolling power sticking with brakes and moves is a relative weakness. Perfect. That's what I would recommend. Uh, okay, let's see. Stuart has a good question. Um, okay. I want to start training road, but I'm concerned that with the season just around the corner, I have missed the boat. Do I need to start with a base build or can I start with a program or specific to my A race? 
You can start wherever you want to. Um, if you don't have any fitness, I wouldn't recommend jumping into a specialty plan simply because certain things aren't in order. It opens you up to a greater likelihood of injury and you're, you're putting the cart before the horse, so to speak. Mm. Um, and we've talked many times about even the, the sweet spot base, the, the low and mid volumes, they're really well-rounded. So you'll, you'll address a lot of what you're going to encounter in your races anyway. And we just had uh, Jared who raced Redlands and he did a uh, sweet spot base into it and did a very high level Quite of fitness. Well. So I think he got second in the TT. Isn't that he, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I so, think so. Yeah. Um, and, and you see, Good if job. you're new to structured training, you can get a big boost in sweet spot yeah. too. So mm -hmm. uh, like we had before, somebody did sweet spot base in a 30 watt bump. That is not... I mean, unheard of. It, mm -hmm. It's not unheard of, but it's also don't like. If you're a high, if you're four watt per kilo, oh yeah, right, yeah or you're, you're probably up there. Thirty watts is it's, it's hard to get thirty watts. Yeah, yeah. but so Stuart, there's no uh, like sweet spot base won't make you slower. Uh, mm -hmm. But also, if you've been doing all this structured training, you have a whole bunch of uh, uh, like foundation, you can totally go into specialty, right, Chad? Yeah, absolutely. This one's from Daniel. Uh, this one, hopefully we already answered this, but you asked it after the fact, Daniel. So I don't understand how your tarmac is so heavy, meaning Nate's bike. Mine is also the new model 61. with stock DI2, size 56. Ding, ding, ding. Stock Revolve 50 wheels and weighs 6.8 kilograms. And he says it's the disc version, and that's with pedals and ball cages. Yeah, it's the size. And once again, it doesn't proportionately increase, right? Like the 61 w may weigh significantly more than the others. It has longer tubes. It may need to be stiffer. They're really chasing the bike to handle a specific way, I think, uh, instead of just, you know, weigh exactly the same or step up in 100 grand or 50 gram increments or something. So that's why uh, Dorosky says, what's up, guys? How can I fit sprint training outside on the road if I'm doing the mid-volume specialty crit plan? Uh, when you're, I, It depends. So first of all, if the mid-volume plan is pushing you up to your limits in terms of how much stress you can take, uh, then I would recommend substituting it for a specific workout if mm -hmm. you plan to do that. However, if you feel like you can fit in more stress, then I would recommend fitting in sprint training as an accessory in addition to the training that you're already doing. Um, but that's the main crux yeah, of it. Didn't me. do it when you're fresh. So don't mm -hmm. wait until Thursday if you can do it on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't rest on Mondays, do it on Monday. Do it when you're freshest. And uh, if it's in addition to everything else you're doing, you don't want to blow up your training load too much. Just keep them short. I mean, you can get a lot out of six second, eight second, 10 second sprints. Yeah, absolutely can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that the big key there is make sure you do them when you're fresh. Because otherwise, you're just really not getting enough. <laughs> Okay, and I think that basically covers it um, in this case. Uh, okay, thanks everybody for joining us. Awesome podcast. You can join us again in three weeks for a live podcast, uh, but you will have plenty of podcasts coming out in between now and then. Stay tuned to our YouTube channel. We're going to have some cool race analysis stuff coming up, including when Nate and I were like from Talladega Nights and we shake and baked and got ourselves a win. <laughs> I think we should have like, it's gonna, it, these are hard for us to do, but I think we have nine but what we've lot. already done and what's coming up, nine races. It's a lot. Oof. Yeah. So uh, it takes a lot of work to kind of get the videos going, but stay tuned for that because we'll have them on there. And uh, yeah, stay tuned to our social channels. We have some, well, like I said, we'll have some announcements coming up. If you're going to be at Sea Otter, come see us. Nate and I will be easy to find. He's really tall and I'll be next to him. Chad's not there, so <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. a lot of people won't come. Yep. Yeah. And if you're racing the Enduro race or the cross country race or the road circuit crit you can probably see us out there. If you're racing the Cat 3 race, let me win, because that would be great for the channel. <laughs> yeah, Cat 3 on the road for both of us, and then uh, Cat 1 for mountain bike for me. Uh, Enduro, I'll just be wherever. I don't know where I'll be. Um, I don't know how they see that. So anyways, thanks, everybody. We'll see you all soon. Check out Forum.TrainerRoad for this episode. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.